Okay, um, sorry for the delay. We didn't have much time to get started today. and a few technical issues. But, um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, my name is Ben Voigt, uh, product manager at Derivative. I've been with the company since uh, 2002, so quite a while. Um, uh, nice to see you all here, and thank you very much for coming to our, our first major summit event. Um, today, this is going to be an introduction to Touch Designer, so I'm going to go through um, all the tools and the place and the workflows that you might use to create projects. This is usually what uh, the type of workshop or type of lesson I'd start with a, a two-day workshop that we'd be doing, and then in the afternoon we'd go into projects and stuff. But today we're just going to focus on all the building blocks and all the things you need to know to start building your own things. Um, uh, there's I'm going to be running uh, Windows, but when it comes to Macintosh, I'll try to uh, highlight the difference, like if there's a different key shortcut or uh, if it's slightly different menu position. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of people, but I do encourage you to ask questions if I didn't explain something well or if you want a little bit more clarification, because if you have a question, somebody else is probably thinking the same thing. Um, also, uh, my assistant, uh, Ivan, is going to be um, helping out later, so if you have a personal issue on your computer, like something's not working right, please raise your hand and he'll come around and try to work you through that. Um, we're going to go for a, a, about two hours and then take a, a small washroom break, stretch your legs and everything, and then keep on going until lunchtime. Uh, then we have an hour lunch, and in the main room downstairs, we're going to have a keynote kickoff uh, where Greg is going to give a presentation and uh, some other members of the community are going to give an introduction as well. Um, so, um, any questions before I begin? Or has everyone got Touch Designer running and uh, okay? Everyone have power? <laughs> um, if anyone gets hot uh, along here, you can pop open the window like this crack it a bit. Um, I think with all these computers running full tilt, we're going to have uh, quite a bit of heat in here soon. So, Okay. So as I was uh, telling you earlier, this is actually how we find out what builder we're running. And in a lot of software, it's not so important, but in Touch Designer, we regularly post updates. About every two weeks, we post a new build. Um, we have a very continuous development cycle, so you're going to get bug fixes more than once a month. Um, so it's important to know this build number, uh, especially when you're reporting a problem or if you're asking a question. People might say, oh, it's because that's already been fixed in a newer build. So um, besides finding out where that build number is uh, right here uh, under the help menu about Touch Designer, there's also a, an update button in the upper right corner, and that's going to light up whenever there's a new build available for you to download. And uh, I recommend updating as quickly as possible, unless, of course, you're about to install an installation or deliver a project and you don't have time to fully test it and vet it, then you, know, you might want to take, um, take some caution there. So, <clears throat> The first thing I want to do is just talk about the structure of a Touch Designer project and uh, how the hierarchy in Touch Designer works. Um, right up, this is the, uh, the workspace or the worksheet. Um, we also refer to it as the network editor. And you'll notice that there is an address bar up here. And this is the current position I am in the Touch Designer project. Um, so <clears throat> I can go up a level uh, right now just by uh, clicking on this slash and go up to the root. This is the top level of the project. Uh, another quick way of going there is just hitting this little home button and you can jump right to the root. So you can think of these, uh, we call them components, but you can think of them as a folder and file hierarchy structure. So it's, it's sort of similar to uh, your Windows structure here. And if I go here, you're going to have all these folders with inside subfolders and then eventually also files that do something. <clears throat> and Touch Designer is set up uh, in very much the same way. So to navigate, obviously you can use this address bar. It's just like the Windows, um, the Windows navigation, so you can select where you want to go. I want to go back into Project 1. Uh, from there, I can again click on the slash and see, oh, I can go inside Geo 1, and now I'm inside Geo 1. You can just click on these to go around. There's also a bunch of keyboard shortcuts uh, for this. So if you want to go up a level, you can 
press the U key. And if you want to go in a level, you can press the I key, which will go in the one that you have selected, so you can press I. And I bring this up because uh, there's also a, a way of scrolling through these menus with the scroll wheel. So if you scroll out with your scroll wheel a lot, you're going to jump up a level, and a lot of people will do that at the beginning and kind of get lost. Um, so uh, you can use the scroll wheel to dive in and out of networks. Uh, you just put the mouse back over your component and scroll in like this, and you'll eventually zoom into that network. Um, Greg has termed this Zooey, the zoomable user interface. So I don't know. I think he's working on a trademark for that one. But... <clears throat> Um, other than that, uh, you could also, if you're up here, sorry, uh, just double click on something and get inside it. So if you're ever looking at your network and it doesn't look like mine and you've lost your place in, in the project, just refer back to this address bar here and double check with me where I am, I'm at, or I'm currently in project one, and make sure we're working in the same space. Um, later on when I show you more about components, it'll become clear why this is important, uh, but generally uh, you can compartmentalize or make a modular components where uh, you have ideas encapsulated in, in one area. So if I was to make, you know, an effect, I might build it inside one of these folders and then be able to reuse it, copy and paste it, etc. So, <clears throat> um, over here on the left we have a palette and I'm just going to close this because I'm not going to talk about it right now and it's basically a collection of um, uh, of tools and filters that uh, right now it's just taking up some space. So I'm just going to close it here with this X and give my space, myself a little bit more space. So first of all, I just want to show you for, for people brand new just how you move around the network editor. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, if you use the left mouse key to drag around, you can move around this space. and. It is an infinite canvas, so you can keep on moving and building uh, to your heart's content. It doesn't really end, or I've never seen the end of it. Um, <laughs> the middle mouse key, uh, you can hold down um, and zoom by going left and right. You can also use a scroll wheel, but the scroll wheel you have to use with a little caution because at a certain point, it's going to jump you up a level, so you have to get used to that. Um, I prefer to just hold down the middle mouse key and, and drag left and right. Now, if you don't have a middle mouse key, or if you're just on a trackpad, or you're on an airplane, something like this, um, there is an option for uh, a second option for middle mouse, and that's holding down the Alt or Option key and using the right mouse button. That will then substitute in as a middle mouse. So um, when you're in a jam uh, or just using a trackpad, it's good to know. <clears throat> now, the zooming is important because um, Often you're going to make very big networks, uh, they're going to keep on growing, and it'll become hard to see where you're working, and, and a lot of people will tend to want to resize nodes like this to see it better. Um, and I, you can do this, but I, I tend to uh, discourage it, especially when starting out. Uh, the problem with this is, let's say we make this really big, and you know, okay, now I can see my work, but the next time you add a new operator, um, it's going to be tiny. And the more you do this, the, the smaller the, uh, the names of the nodes get, and it just makes everything really messy and hard to work with. So ideally, you want to keep zooming. You want to zoom in and out of your networks. Um, I'm just going to put this back to where it was. And zoom in and look at it like this. And keep everything at a, at a nominal size. Um, after a while, at the end, if you want to highlight something, you can then bring some attention to it to bring, to bring it out big, but don't keep building and making things bigger. That's just going to make it hard for you. So, um, <clears throat> um, moving nodes around, you saw me just moving them, that's easy. You can just drag on these nodes like this, um, or I can select multiple nodes by, you know, holding down shift and selecting another one and then, and then dragging them around. However, there are some nodes that, like this one here, uh, if I try dragging on it, you'll see it's, it's actually not moving, it's, it's interacting with the viewer. And what's happening here is this node here, um, its viewer has, is in interactive mode, it's called viewer active. So right now I can't drag the node, but I can inspect the, in, the inside the viewer, right? So if I want to turn that off, uh, this little viewer active flag in the bottom with the cross uh, turns that off, and then you can drag the node around. So it's a little bit of a got you in the default uh, file there uh, as to why you can't move that. Now there is a hidden trick here actually. If you're 
don't want to turn that off, you're lazy, or you just want to leave it on all the time, um, you can use the name field down here to drag it. That's a little bit of a secret. It takes a while to find if you don't know about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, usually I just turn this off and then you can move things around. So uh, yeah, and back to selecting, I did forget there's another option. If you hold down shift, you can box select with the left mouse. So that's an easy way of selecting a whole bunch of things. And let's say I want to just select these and move them over because I'm ready to insert something here. Um, uh, right mouse button will also give you a box select. So there's a few different options there for interacting. Now in Touch Designer, uh, all of our networks, the data flows from left to right. So in this network, you can see there's an image here. Uh, the data is flowing down into this filter, which is displacing it. It's just making a, a sort of a, a wavy pattern based on this, this other input. And then the data is just flowing continually to the right through this geometry and uh, into an out node. Um, <clears throat> now, if you, you can see that these are animated wires, that means that there is some data flowing and these things are calculating. If you s don't see that and things aren't working for you, very often um, the timeline might be paused down here. And this happens a lot in new workshops because uh, spacebar is the hot key for that. So if you happen to hit spacebar, you'll pause your timeline. And then you can see things aren't, data's not traveling through and things won't be updating. So if something's not working for you, double check that this timeline down here is indeed playing forward and just press play or spacebar again and, and get it going. So let's look a little bit more at these nodes themselves. Um, uh, I'm gonna just highlight or select the displace top here. And the displace top <clears throat> does what its name suggests. It displaces pixels uh, from the first image based on some input in the uh, second image. Um, so whenever uh, I select a different node, its parameters are the ones that are highlighted over here on the right. And if you don't see these parameters over here on the right, uh, the hotkey for that is P, which is for parameters, and it just toggles it on and off. But as I select different nodes, you'll see that those are the parameters that are currently being displayed. So uh, we can change any of these parameters the, any way we want. So you know, if I change this displace weight to maybe 0.3, Okay, that's not what I want. 0 0.3. You can see it has a bit more of a displacement. Um, now, you can type in uh, any number you want, but it's not a very interactive way of working. So uh, we have something called the value, value ladder when you're working with parameters. So if I uh, hold down the left mouse button, you'll see this little dialog pop up. And it has five different numbers. Sometimes it has three. In this case, it has five. And these are different increments. So whichever increment I choose, uh, let's say I just go with 0.1 in the middle. If I start moving left and right from there, it's going to adjust the parameter in 0.1 increments. OK? If I let go and let's say uh, I hold down again and go down to 0.01 and go left and right, now I'm going to adjust it in 0.01 increments. All right. So this is the way uh, I, we usually, you know, just kind of find a sweet spot with parameters or quickly adjust um, any numeric parameter. Now, another little tip, uh, hey, Ivan, uh, you might want to just keep an eye on it. Some, if people have problems in the back, uh, just put up your hand and Ivan will come around and help you on your screen and, uh, or talk amongst yourselves, that's fine, but uh, I knew Ivan was getting absorbed in my, in my speech. <laughs> so another trick with uh, adjusting parameters is uh, sometimes you'll see that these, um, there's, there's a tuple or sometimes it's a triple of parameters. And sometimes you want to actually adjust them both at the same time by the same amount. So instead of adjusting both separately, if you uh, hold down the left mouse button on the name itself, you can adjust both of them at the same time. So uh, this is handy for scaling, for example, scaling a sphere in all, in all X, Y, and Z. You can do all three at the same time or moving something in X and Y at the same time. So, so another interesting thing here is um, 
this UV weight. If I, I move this UV weight slider, you can see that it's definitely having an effect on the, uh, <clears throat> on the output. But it's also moving this uh, offset weight down below. And this is because there's a little expression here. Uh, this is actually Python expression. And it's looking at this other parameter. So we can make relationships between these parameters as well, which I'm going to show you a bit later uh, how, how to set up. So um, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and the other thing about these parameters, we do most of our work here, is that every single parameter can be animated uh, or controlled by an input device, another parameter, a Python expression, uh, an animation channel. So all of these things are how we make our, <coughs> uh, our systems interactive. Um, so I'm just going to bring this back down a bit to where it was, or a bit, a bit less crazy. So this is um, the movie file in top. This is probably one of the most powerful tops in Touch Designer. Touch Designer is well known for its video playback capability. Um, you can play, depending on your hardware, you can play uh, resolutions up to 8K, 16K, whatever your GPU can handle, basically. Um, so this is one of the most used nodes. Um, but let's actually put a movie in there. Right now, it's just a still image, um, default jelly bean image. But let's, uh, let's load a movie in here. So under the file parameter, little plus sign on the side, we can open that to get a file browser. And um, I'd like you to go to, you know what, I need the files too. <laughs> Go to the files I gave you, and inside the media folder, there's a movies beeple. Um, these are just some uh, beeple movies that are free to download. Uh, you can pick any one you want. I'm just going to pick the second one here, Bach Loop. So the first thing you'll notice is um, it loads, it starts playing. That's great. Now, it does have a little warning message here. And uh, if you ever see a warning message, or even worse, an error message, you can middle mouse click on this node and uh, you read the warning. It's like, resolution is limited to 1280 by 1280 with a non-commercial key. So I haven't got a pro key or commercial key yet. Yep? Uh, question about uh, what type of codex uh, does uh, the uh, OK, that's a good question. Um, that really depends on what you're trying to do, uh, to be honest. Um, so normally, uh, it does, I'll, actually, I'll show you all the list of codecs. Um, for any operator, if you want to see the help for that operator, you can go to the first question mark in the parameters and open this. Let's see how fast the internet is today. <laughs> OK, so these are. Um, actually the file types. It doesn't actually say codec in here. But it uses, okay, so H.264, H.265 um, are great, but those are uh, heavily, uh, heavy to decode. So if you're using really high resolution uh, movies, we recommend uh, HAP or HAPQ. Also Cineform. Cineform used to be a paid uh, codec from GoPro, but now it's free. Um, uh, However, if you're doing certain things, like playing a movie backwards, yeah. these temporally based codecs don't work well. So you have to go, in that case, to something like an animation codec or a photo JPEG codec, and then you can play them back and forth. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So, yeah. Does this take a DXV codec? It does not take DXV. Uh, HAPQ is based on a similar technology to DXV. We find the, the performance is the same. Uh, unfortunately, you are going to have to rip your your libraries of DXV, so. <clears throat> and we'd like to, but Resolume has actually kept that as a proprietary format, so it's not uh, available for licensing. So, um, HAPQ is now gaining a little bit of, uh, more um, acceptance, like uh, there's a QuickTime plugin, there's a lot more things that play it, uh, you can encode it with a few different applications now, so, um, uh, and I think, uh, I think Resolume plays HAPQ as well now. No, it doesn't? We should send them a request. <laughs> yeah. Can I take the D for those people that came in late? Sure. Got it. Uh, will this do anything? It will do something. Here, give me that back. Is there, is there a third key? Does somebody have the, the... Ah, okay. Thank you. Sorry. No problem.
Hold on a second, I'm just going to reinstate that uh, as not happy. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit about codex. Um, and actually, I can, uh, I can show you that. Plan this is an H.264 codec. And, and uh, this speed parameter will adjust how fast it plays back. So I can, you know, zero is obviously stopped and, and one is uh, regular speed. I can put in any number here, though, even though the slider goes to one, I can put in five and it plays back at five times the speed. Um, so uh, sliders like this are a recommended uh, commonly used range, but you can always overdrive things past that range and see what happens. So touch, just try it, you know. Can you define a different range for something? In these default sliders, which are built in, no. But later on this afternoon, we're, or Today is this morning. We'll get to custom parameters, which you can fully set all that up. So, so yes and no. <laughs> um, these can also go negative, though, since zero is just it's just a number. But uh, negative one will play back this movie backwards. Now you'll see H two six four doesn't like playing backwards. It's just not a good codec for that. So it's kind of stuttering. So if you needed to do this, I'd recommend uh, encoding your stuff in animation codec or photo JPEG. Yeah, it really doesn't like playing backwards. Okay. <coughs> so um, let's start adding new nodes and just go through that. Uh, so to add new nodes, you use the upgrade dialog, and you can open this by double clicking in any of the open space, and it'll open up and show you a bunch of different families. Uh, and we'll get to those in a bit, but it should open as with tops as the default. And tops are the ones that we've been looking at here. They stand for texture operators uh, because all of these are, are calculated on the GPU. So they're referred to as textures in the graphics world. Um, but they're basically for any 2D image, any movie, um, anything like that that you're going to load in is, uh, is loaded in through tops. And they're color coded. You can see that all these purple nodes plug into together and they send the same type of data through the system. So let's start with um, a video device in top. Now this should work for everybody with a laptop because you all have a webcam. So you should get something like that. Everyone have a webcam working somewhat? No? Um, if it doesn't work for you, you can try toggling the active flag. Um, or another application might be using your, your webcam on the machine. I, I'm not sure about that, but often the webcam will get stolen from like a Skype or uh, something else that uses the webcam. For this example, if you can't get your webcam working, just place another movie file in top and get a different movie, for example, and that will be fine. So um, another way of uh, uh, opening this, the shortcut, is the tab key. The tab key is just the keyboard shortcut for this. And um, I'm going to add something that now filters this data. So uh, let's add um, an edge top. Now there's a lot of operators here, so it's kind of hard sometimes to find things. So if you just start typing when you open this, there's a little search field at the top. And if I type in edge, it just highlights that node there. And when there's only one highlighted, you can just press enter and it'll plop it down. <clears throat> so um, I'll just connect this here. So if you left mouse click on the output connector and you get towards an input that wants to go in, it'll kind of have a little magnetic snap <clears throat> and you can just connect it like that. So this is um, an edge top. It's very similar to a Photoshop edge function, um, except it's real time. Um, and we have like parameters like strength and a little you know, black level. Um, you can change the color of your edge if you want. Um, or you can even use that last switch, comp over input, to composite the edge over the original input. Now it's a bit noisy in here because uh, it's, it's dark, um, so I have a lot of noise. So edge is having a little trouble being a, a nice clean edge. I can kind of improve that with the black level a bit. You can see it gets a little bit cleaner. Still a lot of noise, but... That's fine. So, 
So we can also, um, instead of adding new nodes manual or s separately and then connecting them, you can right click on the output of any operator and select a node and it'll be automatically wired. So if I do that, let's, um, let's select a composite top this time and we'll just do a very simple composite job. Now the composite top, um, it's giving me a warning. So again, if I middle mouse click on it, it says not enough sources specified. Um, it's because if you want to composite two things together, you, you obviously need two things. So um, I'm going to take the output of this displace down here and just wire it in. Okay, so if I zoom in a little, you can see something happening here, but the default uh, operation for this is uh, multiply, if I look over here in the parameters. So it's just multiplying wherever this is a, a one and it's bringing that color through. So there's a ton of different operations here that you can play with. Um, we can see what, for example, an over might do. An over just puts the edge on top of it. Um, you can add things together, which is similar to an over in this case. You might want to see what chroma difference does. That does nothing in this case. Darker color. This is a bit brighter than multiply. It's taking the darkest color of the two. Freeze. There's a bunch here. You can just kind of keep going and, and find something that you like. I'm actually going to go with darker color and just, I'm going to crank up the strength of my edge a bit. So we can continue to build these, um, and, and because they're on the GPU, they're very fast. The only thing you really have to worry about is how much GPU memory or RAM you have on your system. So again, if you middle mouse click, this little info box that you get on every node gives you some information like that. It says GPU mem in this top is 3.4 megabytes, and I'm using 150 megabytes out of my total of 1,000, so I'm good right now. Um, hopefully you guys have more than 1,000. This is a real old computer. <laughs> but um, it gets by fine, so um, uh, let's add a little bit more. Let's make a feedback network. It's really quick, and it's a network that you'll use quite often. So um, the first thing I'll do is just right-click on the output and look for feedback. It's in the second column, just off the top. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So that is a middle mouse click. So if you don't have middle mouse, again, you can uh, alt and right mouse. And if that's annoying, uh, you can go over to parameters and there's an info button here, a little icon. And if you click on that, you get the same information for that operator. So that's a little bit easier than middle mouse clicking sometimes. And these uh, are, this pop-up is super helpful for debugging. When there's stuff not working, I just keep on going through nodes and look at, okay, the resolution is correct, the length is correct. You know, you can just go on each node and find out where something's going wrong. So um, it becomes second habit just to check your node out with this. So as I was saying, let's add that feedback top. <clears throat> now a feedback top, um, it takes the previous frame and, and adds to it. So what we need to do is we need to composite this feedback loop back on itself. So we actually need to make a branch here from this composite top. So there's one more shortcut when you're adding nodes, and uh, that's middle mouse clicking. If I middle mouse click on this output and add, let's say, an over top, instead of adding it in line, it makes a new branch. So this way you can branch out into two, two streams. So I'm going to move it over here, and I'm going to composite my input over my feedback. The over uh, is just like the composite top, except the over just does one operation, the over operation. So it's just a simplified version. Um, and it just has two inputs as opposed to the composite top, which you can put in any number of inputs. So if you guys wanted to uh, come in, you could sit, stand around the back. There's some room, or it's maybe not so easy to see through the door. But you're welcome to come in uh, uh, through the back door or, or uh, take a view from the back. Yeah? Can you uh, drop a note? Dropping nodes on nodes will not connect wires, no. Not on the node, but on the wire. That'd be really cool. Uh, no, no, not like Houdini or no, you can't do that, no. But there's the right click. 
Yeah. You can insert stuff in line by right clicking and bringing up this little menu. So inserting there, um, you can do that. And you can also disconnect things if you make an error with this menu. So I just right clicked here and I'm going to disconnect that because that was a mistake. But it wasn't, so I'm going to do that again. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Ivan's going to come around and take a look because I can't see your screen, so uh, it'll be easier for him. But um, you can disconnect things uh, besides the right click and disconnect. You can also click on an input and take this wire out into space and just click somewhere and it'll disconnect. So you can start over from a fresh over like this and then just take your time and connect it properly. Yeah. It does in this case because uh, the overtop is, is, you can think of it as take my first input and put it over my second input. So uh, if I, for example, went back like, uh, da, 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 da. in this case, it's hard to see the difference. But if I was to change this composite node to over, you can see I have white over the movie. But if I switch them around, I'm going to have the movie over the white. I won't see the white because the movie is, is solid, right? So it does make a difference. And I'm going to change this back to, I think I had it on darker color. Okay, so um, I've started this feedback network, but it is not feeding back right now. Um, if I look at the feedback top, it requires a target top. This is saying, like, where do I look to get my previous frame? Where am I going to start this feedback network? And that is just where we're going to merge these two together. So in this case, the feedback, the target top is over one. So you can just type over one into this field, or you can drag and drop the operator into the field like that. And now you'll see I definitely have some feedback happening. Now, feedback is just going to keep drawing on top of itself over and over and over. <clears throat> you can see I definitely have some action here. But what I can do is I can insert other filters in this feedback network to control it or to make it do different things. So <clears throat> I'm just going to move it over a little bit. This is one thing I, you have to get used to in touch when you're building a, a node-based network is just taking the time to make space for your next operator. Don't make it a totally messy spaghetti mess that you can't read later on. Um, just take the time to organize things so you can sort of f follow the data flow through. <clears throat> so I'm going to insert here um, a transform operator. Transform is a cool way to get those sort of washy move, like f uh, feedback effects that are so common or you see everywhere. So I'm going to insert a transform. And it's in the last column just off the top. And now what this will do is for every frame that passes, uh, it's going to do something to it. So if I, for example, scale this down, every frame that passes, it's going to get smaller. And the effect of that, if I go to scale and I hold down, I'm going to move both of them at once. I'm just going to hold down the left mouse button and move it down a bit. You can see that it fades off into nowhere, into sort of the abyss. Now, 0 0.9 happened to be a lot for uh, a feedback. So I'm going to actually increase that using the 0 0.01 to get something that is a little bit, a little bit slower. OK, there we go. I can also transform or translate these things. Um, there's two things for translate. One is in the x direction. The next one is in the y direction. So let's just move a little bit one way or the other. And even 0 0.01 is a lot here. So you just need a little bit, like in the thousandths, and you get some sort of trail effect. Now, the numbers I'm putting in are just arbitrary. So the nice thing about Touch Designer is it's real time. You see the things that are happening instantly. So please just pick numbers and effects that you like. Yeah. Can you connect those parameters to, say, like time? Absolutely, yep. You can have things changing over time, or you can have things animating over time. I'm going to show you that uh, right when we get to channels in, in a second. So um, any of these parameters can be uh, connected to, to whatever you want. 
So maybe I'm going to bring down the Y a bit more, so it's going to it's going to shrink a little bit more in Y. So whatever, it's it's arbitrary, like I said. Okay. Any questions so far? Just about what we're uh, what we're doing here? And... Uh, one question. Yeah. Is there any shortcut if you don't have a mouse yeah. to change the parameters uh, as it uh, So if you hold down, if you hold, like left mouse button is to bring this up, so if you hold it down, it should pop up, and then you slide left and right. But it's not ideal. I mean, it's difficult sometimes. Yeah. Is it possible to Uh, you, you, not just one. I mean, you can pause the whole system like this, but uh, really, it, touch designers real time. I mean, most of the time, you're going to want to be designing something that is working in real time all the time. So if it's too slow, you can't use it in the end anyway. So redo it. You know what I mean? And there is optimal ways of doing things, and there's ways of doing things that are going to get you into trouble and chew up your resources really quickly. So I'll talk a little bit about optimization later on, and and what you can do to 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 keep that. 60 frames a second, hopefully. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it relates to this question as well. Can you uh, temporarily disable a node, like a bypass? So there is exactly that, a bypass flag. So see this little flag here, this arrow? Um, if you have bypass that, it, the data flows through it and doesn't have any effect. So you can kind of say, oh, is this, is this what is adding this effect? Yeah, it is. It's that one right there, OK? so. So um, another uh, node that is really common to use in a feedback network is the level top. And I'm just going to move this over a little bit. And we're, yes? Uh, what's the output? Which, which node is your Final output? Yeah. That's entirely up to you. <laughs> but um, what, what we're going to do is, uh, after I show you all these parts, I'm going to show you how to address a projector, set up multiple monitors, make a full screen application, stuff like that. So we'll get to that, but yeah, yeah, we'll just take baby steps. So, but any of these nodes that you see, you can at any time select and put to a projector. So you don't need to think about it ahead of time. So, so let's add in insert here, uh, right click on this line and insert a level top. And level is down in the uh, second column. And the nice thing about level, um, well, it has all the things that you're going to look for to boost things like gamma, contrast, brightness, black level. Um, it also has on the post page something called uh, opacity. And for feedback, this is cool because you can fade it off and make that, that sort of wispy trail effect. So I'm just going to bring it down a little bit to about 0.9 and then go back to my transform maybe and crank this up a little. Yeah, that's fine, whatever. So um, yeah, this level can be basically a control for how much feedback you have uh, on this opacity. So now you can also do things like um, reduce one color, like if I removed red here, over time it's gonna take the red out of the image the high red, so that's an interesting effect for feedback. Um, and the other things like brightness and gamma, you can do crazy stuff. So if you boost the brightness every frame, it's going to start adding that oversaturated, like overexposed sort of, sort of look. Go ahead. Yeah. Is there a shortcut for recalling the default? Yeah, so the question was, how do you reset it to default? And if you right click on any parameter, you can just select reset parameter. Um, and I think if you right click on a node, there is reset all parameters at once if you want to. 
Now, another, uh, that brings, just makes me think another great way of uh, finding out what has been changed in a node. Like, let's say you're looking at someone else's project and you're like, I don't know what is actually different here. So, in any parameter dialog, there's this uh, sort of bullseye over on the right. And if you click it, it shows you only the parameters that have been changed. So, you can go through someone else's work and turn that on and say, oh, they changed these three parameters to get this effect. Um, now, the only trick with it is that if you leave it on and you go to the next node, it's going to show you no parameters because they might all be default. So you have to remember that when you turn this on, just remember to turn it back off when you get back to uh, normal work. Okay. No. No, there's no diffing really or anything like that, no, no. Um, speaking of which though, since uh, we've got a successful feedback network, let's just save our work. And um, I'm just going to be lazy and save it on my desktop. But you can save it wherever you, actually save it in the folder that I gave you. Um, that makes it a bit better. So, Intro day one. Now, um, I just wanted to show you something about saving in touch. Uh, when you save a file, it adds a number to it. And this is the, it's basically called the save increment. So every time you save, if I press Control S again, or on Mac, Command S, um, it's going to increase this number. Now you see it's dot two dot to and dot three dot to. So this gives you a little bit of a running history of your work. And if you've gone into something and you're like, oh no, this is totally wrong or, or something crashed, you can go back a couple steps and try again. Um, now, the one thing with that is that if I go to my folder, it does rather, oh, I hate these, these little hidden nodes, sorry. Let me just turn this off, options. Okay. Um, uh, my preference has already been set, but you, you will see in your folder, you'll see intro day one, dot one, dot two, and dot three. So what I like doing is going to the preferences, and mine's already set up like this, so I'm sorry, but you guys should check this out. If you go edit preferences, instead of just uh, the first preference here, increment file name on save, instead of just incrementing it, I always use increment and copy to a backup folder. So what this does is it copies your last one, your previous one, into a backup folder just to keep your project folder nice and clean. So you guys probably see one, two, and three in your folder now. Um, and right now, if I save this again, control S, and go here, you'll see I have a backup folder where it's been copying these in and just taking care of some housekeeping for me. So I think this is a parameter that should be default on, but it's not. So um, I recommend using that. Um, if you'll see some of Greg's talks later on, he has files that he's been working on for four or five years that are 60,000, 70,000, so you can understand how big this folder might get uh, after you are saving every few minutes as you work. So, um, <clears throat> we've built this little network of uh, images and feedback. Uh, one handy key to know about is anywhere in touch that you press H is home. So it will home your network and you can see everything at once. You can also do that in viewers. So if I had turned on this, this 3D viewer again and I was zoomed way out, you know, and it was over here or something, if I press H in there, it'll home it and center it. So that's sort of a global um, handy shortcut. Excuse me while I lose my voice. But... <clears throat> Um, if we look at the uh, opcrate dialog, you'll see these different colors of nodes. And these are all the different operator families. And they all deal with <coughs> different types of uh, data, basically. So the first one here is, uh, the first one other than TOPS is CHOPS. So if I look at CHOPS here, they're green. And CHOPS stand for channel operators. So channels can be animation channels. Uh, they can be input channels from devices, so uh, data channels coming in from other software. Um, uh, audio channels, 
Um, so anything that is channel data, um, it kind of it comes through in chops here. So you can see here this noise uh, chop um, is an animation channel of uh, a noise function. All right. So the next one um, is SOPs, and SOPs stand for surface operators. Uh, that means like a 3D surface. So I could, uh, let's say, select a torus over here in the last column and uh, lay it down. And this is a 3D, um, a 3D object. You can see it has a, a Y axis and X axis. If I make this viewer active here using that little, uh, that little star icon that I showed you down in the lower right, I can interact with it and see it. Oh, yes, it is definitely a torus. Okay. So these are, um, these, this is all 3D data that will be flowing through uh, SOPs. The next one is MATS, and that stands for materials. And this is materials for these 3D surfaces. Um, so I'm not going to show that right now. We'll talk about that when we get to rendering, because you can see it only when you render it. So, but let's go to the next one, which is DATS. And these are uh, data operators. So they, they hold text, um, text in table data. So in this case, if I make this viewer active, I can come in here and type whatever text. This is text and uh, hello world. I can't spell. Um, and you can write any text in there that you want. You can also put it in scripts in here. You can put Python in here. You can run Python scripts from here, which I'll show you, but we won't get into too much today. The other really popular type of a DAT is a table DAT. It's down at the bottom of the second column. And the table dat is like a spreadsheet. So, um, you know, if I wanted to make uh, something like this, I can right click on the column and say add below. <coughs> add below. Okay, so banana, cherry. Maybe this is, um, maybe this is prices or something in cents. Absolutely. So um, it accepts tab delimited. Um, so you can output from Excel tab delimited. Um, you can actually also convert in touch a CSV file, but there's a couple steps to that. Um, so yeah, you can load in spreadsheets from any other application or you can download data from the like GPS data or something like that and just drop it in. So yeah. Um, so the, the supported file types are, uh, I think, dot text and dot dot text and dot dat files. Dat is internal to touch. So it has to be in a dot text file, but if I had a text file, do I have a text file around here? No, I don't. But um, if you dropped it in, it would just come in as a dat already. So. Just by dropping and dropping? Yep. Yeah. On map, what is ready to click? I mean, if you just on a trackpad, is there a key command I can do? Um, on a trackpad, right click is uh, two fingers, I think. If you have it set up the way I do, yeah. I don't know. Yeah? Okay. And then if you hold down the alter option and you right click, you should get middle mouse. You should get middle click. Yeah. Um, for working in networks, working with the trackpad and two buttons is okay, but when you get into 3D work, I really suggest using a mouse because you do kind of need to work on all the axes. So think about investing in a small mouse. It's, it's definitely going to save you some, some trouble, some time. So let's just look at what's similar uh, with these nodes and, and, and interacting with them. You know, if, if I middle mouse click on this, this uh, image up here, it shows me the, the resolution. So this is, this is a better idea here. This is 1280 by 720, and it shows me the length of the movie is 551 frames, and the sample rate of the movie is 30 frames a second. This is all information about the top. If I go down to chop, the pop-up dialog is just giving me information about uh, this chop. It's saying it has one channel of data, and it's 120 frames or 120 samples long. That means there's 120 bits of information going by. It gives you a sample rate that's 60 frames a second, so uh, samples a second, sorry. So it, it tells you a little bit about this. And likewise, in a SOP, you have 3D type of information. You know, how many points and primitives, and the center and the bounds. Um, 
So all, all this information is context sensitive. That's, there's not too much information that is of any use other than, I guess for a table data it tells you how many rows and columns and that can be handy, but um, it's not really that important. Um, fine, thanks. So um, the other thing is that they all have uh, some similar flags. I showed you the viewer active flag. So on all of these, if you make the viewer active, you can inspect your data more. Like let's say I want to go over to the beginning of this and take a look at you know, this, this first sample here. And whenever you're in a viewer, you can right click and get those viewer options. So there's options for every different type of viewer. Um, maybe here I'll turn on, I don't know, dots per sample. So in dots per sample, now I can see a dot for every single sample of information. Um, and uh, likewise, if I go down to the 3D geometry and make this viewer active, I can then tumble it. Tumbling is the left mouse button. Uh, middle mouse is zoom. And right mouse is panning. And I, again, H is for home when you get all screwed up and you can't get back to your, your bearings. Um, you can right click here and see the options for this type of viewer. And in this case, there's some things like home, which is in case you forget that it's H. Um, display options is a whole dialogue of options for things like points and, and normals and fun stuff that we'll talk about later. Um, or like, uh, for example, wireframe. Wireframe uh, right here, the hotkey is W, so you can see the wireframe topology of this torus, just to inspect how it's built and if you have anything strange going on. Um, viewer active is needed for all that to edit, so that's good, good to know. Um, they also all have on the left side a familiar set of flags. So um, <clears throat> this basically just turns this viewer off. In some cases, you might want to do this. If, if this chop had, well, let's see if I can make it chug a bit. Um, if this chop had 1,000 channels, let's say, I can do this little short form 1,000. That is a lot to draw for the processor. So you'll see my frame rate up here in the center. That's how the frame rate I'm currently running on. It's just chewing up my frame rate. So in this case, I might turn off this viewer. The data is still in there, but um, yeah, it's kind of chugging. Actually, this is taking a lot of time because it's noise too. So that's maybe an aggressive example. But there, that's better. 100 channels of noise um, is fine. But that viewer will still drop your frame rate. And so, so sometimes you want to turn that off. Um, I usually leave them on unless I really have uh, some data there that uh, is, is killing my performance. Um, this is an immune flag, which uh, it has to do with cloning, which is outside of the scope of this discussion. <laughs> but um, it is a feature that uh, you want to see it when it's on, so it's there as a flag. We talked about the bypass, and bypass basically just bypasses what that operator is doing. And the lock flag, um, it's kind of good to know about because if you lock something, if you accidentally click on it, um, it's going to just lock that operator with the data that it has in it and nothing is going to flow through it anymore. So um, if nothing's going through a node, make sure it's not locked, first of all. Um, but second of all, if you were to say, uh, send this to somebody and you wanted them to see the image, but you didn't want to send the whole movie, you can lock this like this and save the file and it'll save that data in the file so you don't have to include the movie. So this is really nice for your, when you're maybe sending us a support question and you, you have a movie and you don't want to send the two gigabyte movie but you want a frame of it. So you can do that. Um, if you press unlock, you have to um, accept it. I guess that's a good example. So for, for example, if, if I disconnect this from here, it's going to break. There's no input coming in. But if I lock this and I disconnect it, it holds that data in there, right? Now that's why it gives you that conf confirm. When I unlock it, it's like, are you sure? Because there's no input in here right now. And once you unlock it, you're going to lose this data for good. There's no undo. So, okay. Um, in that case, uh, it's fine. Um, also, these are the name fields down here, and if it's not obvious, you can rename these to anything you want. So um, it's good practice to name things that are, you know, just sort of after a while you might have 100 movies or you might have 
a whole bunch of math nodes and you want to know what each math node does. So you could say math rotate, math scale, and just kind of keep your uh, project organized. <clears throat> So we've, I've just shown you the different families of, of operators and how they have different data. Um, now, the really powerful thing in Touch Designer with these different types of data is how easy it is to convert things into different data formats. And um, this lets you look at your data in a different way or use it in a different way. So I'm just going to give you an example here. This chop here is an animation channel of noise. But you can see that we're converting it over to an image here. It's a little hard to see, so you don't have to follow me here. I'm just going to do something that makes it a little easier to visualize um, by making it a square resolution. Um, so just give me a second here. OK. So you can see here, um, and if I crank up this amplitude a little bit, you see here where this channel, this animation channel is one, where I'm getting a white color image, and where it's zero or a low number, I'm getting black. All right, so I'm converting animation channel. This could be from a sensor, it could be from a, uh, some keyframed animation. I'm converting it into an image. So that, that can be interesting. Um, I could also go the other way. I could take this image and turn it into animation. All right, so that might help you in some way. Now, I could also convert this into a data operator. Like, let's, if I right-click on an output an op operator and I go to a different op family, it'll give me some options here. It's like, hey, you can convert this data by selecting a chop to dat. So a chop to dat is taking a chop and turning it into a dat. And if I look here, this is a spreadsheet. For every single dot or sample in here, I'm getting a row of data. So I have 120 rows for my 120 samples. So, and the inverse of that, if you had a spreadsheet or a table of information coming from, I don't know, you downloaded the internet or a sensor or another application, you could convert it into an animation channel, right? Go the other way. Um, the other thing is we had those SOPs, which are 3D uh, data. So if I do the same thing and I go to SOPs, there's a CHOP2 SOP, convert a CHOP into a SOP. So I'm going to drop this down. Now, by default, it doesn't work straight out of the box, so I'll just do a little magic here. I'll change the channel to be Chan1, and I'll um, delete this and say, make it move in Y. And now, my animation channel is a 3D object in 3D space. Okay. So this is something to think about, because not only does it um, help you look at your data with a different perspective, but sometimes it helps you get around a technical limitation of your computer. You know, sometimes you want to do things uh, with so many numbers that you might want to put it onto the GPU. So you might want to convert it into an image, do a bunch of calculations on it, and then fire it back down into an animation channel because the GPU is more powerful, you know. Um, or it just might give you an insight on, uh, it might be really cool to see uh, an image version of, uh, of your animation, you know, or, or take sound and turn it into an image. Um, so we're going to do a lot of converting data types here. Um, and it's one of the powerful features of Touch Designer is just how easy it is to convert your data formats. So, uh, so any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. As a 3D? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I I did go really fast because I was just um, just uh, getting a point across. But if you right click on the output um, and select um, SOP chop to SOP. Now the reason it's giving me a warning is it, it's, it's looking for in the channel parameter, it's looking for channels TX, TY, TZ because it thinks, oh, we're making something 3D. Let's use TX, TY, and TZ channels, right? Well, my chop, it doesn't have those channels. It only has a chan one, right? So forget about these defaults here that someone put in years ago. We'll just put in chan one. And then the warning is now we have more attribute values than channels selected. So I have one channel, but I've said uh, I want three attributes. So again, those defaults just don't work for this case. So I'm going to delete them all. And if you go to the drop down, there's a drop down menu on the right. 
um, you can say what chin one is going to map to. So in this case, I wanted it to do the Y position, which is here. And if I select that, then it automatically maps Chan 1 to the Y position. Anything else before I... Yeah? Uh, how to enable other channels? Other channels? Other channels. Like a uh, minor solution when you put a chapter 1 solution. I have a transparent background. But when you have a transparent background. Um, <clears throat> sorry, so is the question... This one here? Yeah, this one. And uh, in my computer, there's a transparent background. So how can I make it to black? Like uh, you mean, okay. Um, you mean this? Yeah, I think it's a good question, though. So uh, this, this checkerboard in the background, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is like just to give you an indication that it's a transparent image. So if you don't like seeing that, it's sort of like a thing from Photoshop, so you know there's alpha there. But if you don't like seeing that, you can go into preferences. And you can go into tops, because this is a top thing. Um, and viewer background can be changed to black, so that you don't see those. I personally, like, like at the end, when you output to a projector, you're never going to see the checkerboard, because it's just black. But when I'm working inside touch, I often like sometimes to see that alpha channel, just so I know. Um, I'm going to keep it on, because it's the default, so everyone else can just follow me along. But uh, personal preference, yeah. Anything else? I didn't catch how you got the chop into that image. Uh, this was set up by default um, in the default uh, starting session. Right. So it would have been like this. If you right click on the output and you want to convert it to tops, it only gives you a few options of these three tops are the only ones that will accept a chop directly. So if I select chop two, it, it will give me that. Oh, that part. Um, I this is a resolution top. So um, by default, this is 120 uh, pixels wide and one pixel high because we only have one channel. So I went into the resolution top and on the common page, I made it a custom resolution. I set it to a square resolution. And then I also have to change the output output aspect to a custom resolution. Otherwise, it's just the aspect ratio will be the same as the input. So I had to change the output aspect to resolution as well. That's a way you can make uh, non-square pixels by changing the aspect. Even if you have 256 pixels there, it's only the aspect of one. It's, it can be handy. <clears throat> OK, so let's actually start um, <clears throat> Build, uh, building something where these, these things work together. So let's go back up to the top <clears throat> where we have our, our little feedback network. And um, I want to now make something that switches between, say, <clears throat> this, this thing without feedback and something with feedback at the end. I want to make a, a blender or a switch, and I want to control it with an input, all right? So the first thing is, how do we switch between two streams? I have one here without feedback and one with a ton of feedback. So there's actually a top for that. And if I open tops and just type in switch, you'll find a switch top in the fourth column, about 2 thirds of the way down. And we can just wire up those inputs. So I want to take this first, this composite, like where, before my feedback chain, and connect it to the beginning, the, or sorry, the first input. And then I'm going to move it over a little and connect the final output of my feedback. So just take your time and, and spread things out. Um, remember to use Zoom to, to get it to a nice shape and, and move it over to the right. Now we have this index parameter. Uh, so if it's zero, it's the first input. And if it's at one, it's the second input. So most numbering in Touch Designer is zero-based. It's just a programmer's thing, and, and zero is the first. Uh, one, two, and three is actually the second, third, and fourth. Um, you'll get used to it. Um, so that's, that's pretty neat. And now I want to make uh, some sort of interaction where I can toggle this. So there's a few ways of doing this, but 
Chops are how we get sensor data or animation data or triggers. So let's go to Chops and let's look for a keyboard in Chop. This is a simple one. Everyone has a keyboard, so it's going to work. <laughs> So keyboard chop, um, if you look at the parameters, the first key that is monitoring is, is the one key, and it's only monitoring one key. So if I type, if I press one, I can see I have a channel that's going on and off here. So that's, that's cool. I can use that now to change this from zero to one, zero to one, right? Because this is just going zero to one when I press it. <clears throat> so, Let's, uh, let's actually connect this uh, to this parameter here. Now, to do that, before I export a chop, I'm going to use something called a null chop. <clears throat> it's in the fourth column, halfway down. And a null chop is just a placeholder. It's for referencing. Um, and we use this all the time when we <coughs> export data from one format to another. And the reason is simple. I'm going to make a reference from this node to this node. And if I later on want to go back and add some other filters in here, <clears throat> I can add them before the null. If I don't do this, if I just reference this node, and then let's say I want to do something like, you know, add a math to multiply it, then I have to break the reference and make a new reference to this math top. And I have to keep on doing it every time I add a node, which is a pain in the butt. So let's just add a null top, uh, sorry, chop. And this is where we're going to reference from. Okay. So this channel here inside, this K1 channel, I want to put onto this parameter. So to do that, I want to get into this chop and get the channel. So I'm going to make the viewer active. When the viewer is active, you can see it, it turns green when it's ready to go. And I have to select, I want to select the switch first so I can see the parameter I'm going to. So if you have this up, you can just drag and drop the parameter onto here, onto the parameter, and press export chop. Now, if it worked, it'll turn green. So that means that the data from this chop, which is the green color in our world, is now controlling this parameter. So now when I press that key, it's toggling between that. So this is our first chop export, and we're going to be chop exporting all the time. Now, if you made a mistake and you accidentally dropped it onto the other parameter or you don't want to do that anymore, you can right-click on it and say remove export. <clears throat> That'll just remove what you did. No, no harm done. done. I'm going to redo that just for practice. Drop it here and select export chop. Did everyone get that working? Okay, so, um, so that's cool. Um, now we can actually use chops to do other stuff. Like what if um, I want the feedback on all the time, but when I press it, it goes off. So it's the invert. Well, I, could just, I can just invert this channel. Um, let's do that by, say, inserting a math chop. A math chop, it'll become a good friend of yours. It allows you to do all sorts of things like multiplying, adding, and, and most importantly, rearranging channels. <clears throat> so if you go to the range page, and here we have a from range and a to range. So the from range is 0 to 1, and that's OK because my channel goes from 0 to 1. That's great. But my output, my to range, I want to invert now. I'm going to change that to um, make 0 a 1 and make 1 a 0. So now I've just inverted that. So now when I hold it down, it does the opposite. And you'll see why now putting that null there for that chop export was, is a good thing. I didn't have to reconnect because I added a node. So let's try something else. Um, I'm going to move these over a bit. There's actually a little option in the switch chop called blend between inputs. So instead of just switching, it'll do a cross dissolve or a fade or a blend, basically. So I'm going to turn this on. And when I go a hard 0 to 1, I don't see it. But if I could make this like fall off, I could do a nice fade, right? 
So after the math chop, we'll insert, there's a couple ways of doing this, but I'm going to use a lag chop. And a lag chop just lags your, lags your, uh, your input. So now when I press it, you see there's a bit of a lag to my effect. So you can keep on adjusting and massaging your input data and how it then controls something like an image uh, operation. Okay. Can I say again how you kind of insert like a, a not in the Yeah. Um, so there's two ways. You could right click on the output and it'll insert it right there. Or if you right click on the wire itself, then you'll get an option of what you want to do and you can insert operator there. But if I did it right on the output, it would insert it as well, like like this. Yeah. So I'm going to save my work just in case something happens. So let's let's move down here a bit. Um, it's an infinite canvas, and I just want to start working down here, down below. Um, so. I'd like to show you um, a ramp top, um, a few more tops that are uh, um, quite important to know how to use and, and will be used often. So a ramp top, it's in the third column, past halfway. And the ramp top is just a gradient, really. Now, it can be a horizontal gradient, or if you change the type, you can change it to vertical um, or circular. Uh, even radial, um, depending on what you're doing. But uh, the reason I want to show you this top is is not because a ramp is that fancy, but it's the UI is a bit is a bit clunky and a bit hard to use. But um, uh, I'm going to show you how to use it. So we have t on this this strip here. There's two tabs. The first tab here is is the black one, uh, the black color, and this tab over here is the white end of the spectrum. So if I select the uh, white end of the spectrum, or whichever one you want, um, I can change that color, and you can see, okay, that's definitely, it's working, it's updating. Now if I want to add another point of color in this, like a third color, it can just click anywhere on here, and it'll add a new tab. And then you can change that color, um, make it whatever you want. Uh, you can add another one, let's say. Okay, so the tricky thing is, and the non-intuitive thing is, is if you want to get rid of a tab, um, to get rid of it, you just drag the tab off and let go, and it magically disappears. So, I kind of have to show you that because it's not uh, very self-discoverable. Okay. Now, there's a couple other parameters here. Phase is just your position, so you can move this. Uh, n not too exciting. Uh, parameter, uh, period is uh, how often it repeats or the actual length of the ramp. So one is uh, default there. Um, now there's something interesting about the ramp top is if you look closely, uh, down at the bottom here there's a little there's a little square that's the color of a dat. So if I, if I pop that open, it's actually a table dat. When you see uh, operators like this uh, and a little tab, it's called a docked node. Um, and sometimes uh, we dock nodes to other nodes that are, they're basically helper nodes. In this case, this table dat is holding all the color information for this ramp. So instead of hiding it in the background or somewhere in the code, we're exposing it here in a dat so you can actually access it or change it yourself. So. For example, this UI, is, it's a little bit difficult if I wanted to make things really close to each other, like really, really tight, and I want to make it an exact color that, I, that, I, that I'm after, right? But I can go down into here, into this dat, and I can make it really tight. Like I can make this 0.47, and I can even insert another table in here and make this 0.45, and make this some sort of a, a red. Now the columns are indicated by the column names at the top, position, red, green, blue, and alpha. And you'll see that, you know, you can just kind of 
add your own things here. Okay? So it's just something to know. Uh, you will see them sometimes hidden because if you're just using the parameters, you don't really need to know about that. But um, now that you do, you can kind of access that extra information and, and do whatever you want. Okay? I want to get this middle one if I can and make it a sort of different color here to get a nice bright yellow line there. Okay. So any questions about the, uh, the ramp top? The next one I want to show you, because everyone will use this in one touch designer project or another, is the noise top. So if you select the noise top and drop it down, um, the noise top uh, creates, well, noise. Uh, it's a noise function. And if you look at the type menu, there's a, a number of them that are calculated on the GPU. And then some older legacy ones that are not on the GPU. These are CPU based. Um, I'd recommend using the GPU ones because they're a factor faster than the CPU ones. Um, so uh, I'm going to change mine to Perlin instead of Simplex just because I, I like Perlin. And uh, the period is basically, uh, you know, how fine your noise is and how long the, the, uh, the noise function is. But uh, you can put a higher number than two in there, like five. And actually, I, I don't want this to be a square anymore. I, I'd rather make it higher resolution. The default is 256 by 256. But if I go to the common page, you can go to resolution. And uh, you can type in whatever you want here. But I can also use the drop down menu for some handy defaults. So I'm going to take 1280 by 720. And the amplitude was a little low to start out. I'm just going to crank it up to about 1 just to, or 1.1 just to get some hotter whites and some darker blacks. <clears throat> so you'll notice that this is, it says it's a 3D noise. Um, what does a 3D noise mean when you have a 2D image? So that's kind of strange, right? Um, so if you go to the transform page, you can see we actually have a 3D transform here. So we can, we can move this noise in different ways. So if I take the first one, this is X, and I can move things in the X axis, right and left. The next one is Y, so it, it's up and down. The last one is Z, and, and if you have selected a 3D noise, 2D, 2D noise won't do this, but 3 and 4D noise will allow you to move through the noise function in and out. So if you, if you don't know what a 3D noise function is, imagine um, a block of marble. You can only see the outside and you see the, the, the marble vein. But as you shave through the marble, you're going to see the vein go through the, the rock, right? And this is basically what we're doing when we're traveling in Z through a noise function, is we're just traveling through the noise really slowly. So you can see that it's a nice, smooth way of, of going through. So we can animate this with chops, right? We have some chops that give us animation channels. So why don't we try doing that? And we can have a nice little... Um, we make a nice little control to travel through our noise function, okay? So I know that I'm going to use uh, three chops here that are sort of my favorite for doing this. And uh, I want to show you a trick to, to add things that you know you want and you want to add them in, in order and already connected, all right? Instead of adding one and connecting it and adding another and connecting it, there's a shortcut if you hold down the shift key. So I'm going to hold down shift and select constant, so my first node. The next one is speed, which is over in this fourth column at the bottom, no, fifth column in the bottom. And the last one is a null because I'm going to export again from it. So now if I let go and close the operate dialog, you'll see I have all those three operators automatically lined up and connected. And all I have to do is just move them over to a better space here. So that's just a shortcut. Um, I like using it. So what I added here was a constant, and a constant is nothing more than a, a number. So it's just a zero, right now it's zero, it can be one, it can be 0 0.5, it's just a number that you can type into this field. It can be minus five, it can be 10. Now the speed chop, um, the speed chop basically will take an input, and for a positive value, it will count upwards, and for a negative value, it'll count downwards. 
And the reason I like using a speed chop is it's really smooth. So if I slow this down, uh, bring, bring this constant down to zero, it stops slowly. And then as I increase it, it starts counting up more fast. So you can kind of think of it like a gas pedal. You know, you can go back and forth. If you go minus, you can then go backwards and it'll start counting down. So we can kind of use this to go in and out of our noise function. So uh, let's just take this number here, this, this number that's counting up, and we're going to export it to this, this TZ channel. So to do that, remember, I make this viewer active and just grab the channel take it over to the last translate uh, value, drop it, and select export chop. Now by default, that's pretty fast at one. Um, don't even need that much speed, just for noise. If I want something s slow and sort of ambient, I can bring it down to maybe 0.1 or 0.2. Now the other thing is maybe I, I want this slider just goes zero to one, right? Which is is fine, but I can't go backwards. I wanna I'd like to go maybe uh, minus one to positive one. So if you remember, we did a rearrange earlier with a math chop. So I'm gonna add another math chop in here. Math. And I'm gonna go to the range page again. Instead of zero to one slider, let's make this negative 0 0.2 to 0 0.2. And now in the middle somewhere is going to be around 0. And on the right side is going to be 0 0.2. And on the left side it will be minus 0 0.2. If that's maybe not quite enough, maybe I'll go 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. But whatever number you like, you can use. <clears throat> yeah, so now I can go back and forth and kind of travel throughout my noise function. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in which parameter uh, we, we apply now to the noise? Ah, so noise on the transform page, um, it's the very last of the translates. So these aren't labeled individually. They just say uh, translate and x, y, and z. But if you click on the plus sign here, it opens up and you can see what the three are individually. So the first one is X, the second one's Y, and the third one is Z. And you can just minimize that again. I don't always bring that up right at the beginning because it's just so many things on the screen and don't want to throw you off, but there's more information there to be had. I'm getting a parameter error. I'm not sure if you that. Is that common? So what it could be is if you drag the whole node there, well, if I drag the whole node here, That's what so it's putting the path of the node there because you're taking the whole chop and dropping it there. So that's incorrect. Um, so what we want to do is, I'm going to remove that. Uh, so I just double clicked on it and removed it. You need to make the viewer active because you want to get the data inside. You want to get the channel, not the chop block itself. Yeah. This one? Okay. So. Um, the first thing I did do was pump up my period to something big because the default period of one is, is, is much more granular. So I made the period uh, high, uh, five. And I bumped up the amplitude to about one because 0.5 is a bit of a gray noise, which isn't so attractive. So just something around one. or. And then in the transform, I'm just using a very slow value here, not high. You notice that it's 0.15. Um, because my math range is minus 0.3 to 0.3. So if I put a big number in here, it's going to go fast. So you want a, a, a small, low number. This one? Yeah. It's a math chop, sorry. Yeah, we do have a problem with small fonts in some workshops, and sorry for those in the back. <clears throat> So we have some noise now, and um, we have a ramp. So I want to show you one of my favorite tops uh, because it's a free effect. It's very fast, and uh, it allows you to do really cool things. And that's called the lookup top. So 
If we open up our upgrade dialog, press tab, and then look for lookup, it's in the second column about halfway down. <clears throat> so the lookup, I'm going to put my noise in the first input. And the second input is uh, a lookup image. So what it's going to do is for every black color in the input, it's going to select something from the second input. So what I can do here is, well, I'm just going to move this up a bit, sorry, and move this down, just to keep everything organized. Hold on. Sorry, sorry. So if I connect this to here, yeah. there we go. But it automatically connects with the RAM to the noise as well. I had, an, I had an, a mistake there where I had both of the nodes selected. So this is one thing in, in, let me just show you. If I have a whole bunch of transforms here, let's say, right? Yeah. If you select multiple nodes in touch and you want to wire them up, you can just wire one and boom. All right? So I accidentally uh, had both of those selected when I wired it in. So make sure you just have the look up top selected and then wire this in. So if we look at this, what it's doing is wherever you see white, it's pulling the color from this end of the ramp. And wherever you see black, it's pulling the color from this side. And it's very fast. I mean, it's 0.1 milliseconds or less um, at 1280 by 720. So it's kind of great. Um, you could use a movie uh, as your input. You can use basically any top. What it's going to do, though, is it's going to look up this middle point here because the lookup parameter is light UV, 0, 1. It's basically saying an X. Take the first one is 0 here. And yeah. Output lookup. You can output that. All right. So, you know, that's fun, and it's a free thing, and it's, it's good to know. Can I ask something? Yeah. Can you make notes inside your projects? Can, you can want to make the notes yeah. next to, I don't know, chalkboard, chalkboard. Comments. Oh. comments, yeah. Oh, comments. Um, so there are a couple of ways. If you want just a really simple comment, like just a sort of, uh, just, just a tag, uh, you can, there's a little comment thing, uh, comment thing here, it's a little okay. bubble. So you can say, um, this is my new color, fine. And then when you middle mouse click on it, you'll see this is my new color. If you want to leave instructional comments of a little bit more substance, uh, I recommend using uh, that and dropping down a text stat like this. And you can make it a bit bigger to leave like a message for somebody. Yeah. Hey, use this. Don't touch this. Something like that. Yeah. We are working on a uh, network editor commenting system, but it's just in the development stage, so nothing yet. Is, um, is there like a versioning way of seeing what's changed between, between sessions or saves? Uh, not easily. There's technically a way, but no one uses it. Yeah. <laughs> you can technically, the, the file is binary right now. We're discussing making it ASCII so you can do git diffs and git versioning and stuff like that, but that hasn't happened yet. Technically, if you go into the deep uh, installation folder, there is something called toe expand and toe collapse, and it'll take the binary and turn it into an ASCII file, and then you can edit it. And then you have to convert it back into the binary to run it. It's not exactly, it's not exactly a workflow that's good, right? But if you have to debug something or you really have to insert something or check something out, you could do that. So, um, my Git comments are very verbose. I just comment my Gits quite often. So, so. Another thing uh, that I'd like to do, because right now I want to focus on these chops, is just show you this little flag down here. Um, this flag on the top is a display flag, and it allows you to put into the background whatever uh, top you have selected here. 
And it's cool, you can turn on a couple of them and get like a before or after shot. Um, unfortunately, you can't order them, so you gotta put them on in the order you want. So like this, and then maybe like this, and you can see before and after. Um, so that's nice when you're on a laptop and you don't have much screen real estate and you wanna always see your output. So I'm gonna leave that on here for when I'm just doing this, if it's not too distracting for you. Now, I just wanna show that the procedural nature of a node-based program, for those of you who don't use node-based uh, programs, is it's really amazing because now that I have this input here as just a constant, I can change this input to whatever I want. So I'm going to go over here to components. And in components, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to soon, we have uh, these panels, which are control panels. So I can drop down um, like a slider control uh, panel. So here's a slider. And if I make the viewer active, I can control this little slider. It's just like a, a slider you find on a mixer, right? Crossfader. <clears throat> and it actually has a chop output here. So I can take this chop output and plug it into my math instead. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I have to disconnect the constant. So let's just disconnect that and then connect the slider, okay? And now I can use the slider here as my input, all right? So that's kind of cool. But uh, I also, it might be a MIDI device, right? Sorry, that was too fast. So, yeah, give me, give me 30 seconds. <laughs> so, it might be a MIDI device, and if I have any USB ports left in this sucker, I can, uh, yeah, all right, all right. I can plug in my MIDI device, right? And let's just uh, quickly show you how to get MIDI in here. There is a dialog that you have to open just to kind of manage your MIDI devices. So under dialogs, you can just follow me here unless you have a MIDI device handy. Um, I'll open the MIDI device mapper. And uh, in here, I want to create a new mapping to start out. So create a new mapping here and it, it gives you an in device, out device, and map option. So I'm just gonna select in device and there's my launch control here, all right? So I got my launch control and if I move a slider, okay, it's definitely connected and I got data coming in. So that's the first step. We know we have this sending data to touch. So I can close this and go into chops again and say, okay, I, MIDI's gotta be in here. So just type in MIDI and uh, there's a MIDI in chop. All right, so I'm going to drop the MIDI in chop down. And there's no channel there. Okay, I just have to move the slider a bit. Now, I'll just open this just to, if you had multiple devices here, this ID here, see this ID says one? This is the device ID here in this MIDI in chop. So if I had have had a second one, I'd have to be careful about which device I'm setting. But by default, it just happened to select one. So that's great. So I have a channel here. And I, I, every time I move a new slider, it adds a channel. All right, so just, it identifies them as soon as you get them. So I just want this first slider here. I want this very first one. So what I can do is select just that one out. I don't care about the rest of the stuff. So let's right click, and there is a select chop for that. A select chop simply selects one of the channels that you have in your, in your chop. So I'm going to select the very first one, which is control 22, uh, control 22. Yeah. Okay. Just, just one, just easier to work with. And now I'm going to disconnect that, that other slider I put in there and connect my, are you ready for this noise to move really fast? Okay. So what happened here is your MIDI is zero to 127, right? So that's not really going to work with the current math range that we have. But all I have to do is go into the math and check out the from range and change it from 0 to 1 to 0 to 127. And now I have the same control as before. Right? So I'm going le left and right. How, how would you map that to the slider? Um, that's a more involved question that I can show you later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you have to actually control the value on the inside. Inside, like this is a component that I showed you at the very beginning of it. So if you go inside, you can see what makes this and you can hijack this value, okay? Um, 
There are other UI elements that we have as well in the palette that are, make it easier to do that, but um, I don't want to get sidetracked right now. So. Okay, so that's cool. Um, but chops are all sorts of things. Chops can be input devices too, like um, it could be uh, a leap motion. If anyone knows what a leap motion is, it's basically a hand tracker um, for about a one meter box above your... So if I plug in my leap motion, and hopefully the drivers are installed, um, and if I go in here and look for leap motion, happens to be one of the devices we have a specific chop for. So I can drop down the chop. All right. And let me see here. Okay, there's my hand. It doesn't like my left hand. Okay, there we go. So that's cool. Maybe um, I'll just use the height of my hand. Okay, so again, this has now got 86 channels by default, and it doesn't even have everything turned on. So let's use a select chop to get what we really want. Um, and in here, I, I want the palm. The palm is just the center of my hand, so that's fine. And I'll get the Y position. So Y is like this. And you can see my range is about uh, 0.1 to about 0.5. So that's, keep that in mind when we connect it to the math chop. I'll disconnect, whoops. I'll disconnect this and connect this to the math chop. And what was that number? 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. So now, you know, I can, I have an interactive traveling through my noise. It's really quick to prototype ideas in Touch Designer. Really quick. So um, you have a connect, there's a connect chop. You have an Oculus ri or a, a rift, there's a chop for that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, would it, uh, if I would send uh, OC data to Touch Designer, Give me 30 uh, seconds. <laughs> so, OSC data, it touches center, right? So we have uh, an OSC chop for that. And I was just going to show um, an app I have on my phone um, called, uh, this is called ZigSim. It's for free. Uh, let me just pull it up here so you guys know what it is. And I recommend it. It gets every single... Ugh. Hold on a second. It gets every single sensor that's in your phone, uh, iOS or Android. Uh, sorry. Really? Come on. Sig Sim. Uh, well, if my Wi-Fi is not working, my OSC data is not going to work either. Yeah. Okay, everyone turn off your Wi-Fi. No, just kidding. Um, what's that password for that? Does anyone know? Okay, I'll try it. No. It's it's maxed. Anyone have a hotspot? No. All right, um, I wanted to show that, but uh, that's unfortunate. I just went off the Wi-Fi. Maybe you can I can, I can take your slot, yeah. Always an issue, isn't it? Pardon? Yeah, so the, the name is, um, I'll just put it in here because, so it's all caps and it's zig sim, like that. And um, it's a really great app. Uh, where is it right now? Okay. Yeah, it didn't let me. And what's that app do, Zixon? 
it gives you the sensor data of everything on your phone. So what is it? Let me just type this in. I'm going to give it a shot. Four six. Four. Let's see if that worked. Yes, this is this is happening. Okay, so Zigsim is here, and actually the guy who made this is uh, his name is Morioka, and he's actually here at, uh, attending our forum. So if you want to talk to him, he's from uh, Kyoto. Um, so let me just connect my phone to the same Wi-Fi network. So OSC can come in from all sorts of applications. OSC stands for Open Sound, Pro Open Sound Control. Um, lots of audio applications use it. Um, uh, a number of, you know, mobile apps use it. Come on, get on. Okay, I think that worked. Um, so. In the ZigSim app, there's a few things you uh, have to do is make sure the protocol is set to UDP because our OSC in shop is using UDP protocol right now. Um, so that's good. Um, the port number here on the app is 50,000. So my port number here is 10,000. So I could just change this to 50,000. Um, or if you're doing multiple devices, you have to set that for each connection. The message format needs to be OSC, not JSON. And the message rate, I turned up to 30 because the default, I think, is one message per second. And then uh, you go to the sensor button and select the sensors you want uh, it to track. I ha have a lot of them on here. And just press start. So hopefully the Wi-Fi is holding up. How does it know what address is Thank you. So the IP address here you have to fill in and uh, to do that I can find the IP address of my computer is 192.168.122.148 so yeah you can plug this in and I'll just keep dropping it down different ports and uh, I'm having a connection problem. I'd rather not go down the rabbit hole right now, but. Is your phone the same network? Yeah. Well, I'm just turning off a Windows firewall because sometimes it's a uh, pain in the butt. Yeah, there we go. It was the firewall. So Windows Firewall is often a blocker, um, something to remember. And actually, if you go to the help for the OSC in, um, there is a big note for Windows OS. If experiencing connection issues, make sure Windows Firewall is disabled because everyone asks that question. Um, so I have some, I have some acceleration here. Um, the Wi-Fi is getting hit pretty hard, so the frame rate's not great. But um, I have my gyros. All right. There's a mic level. Hello, hello, mic, mic. Um, it's compass everything. Uh, it also has touch. So if I do here, I got touch. All right. And X and in Y. So let's use that that uh, touch channel. It's called touch zero two as my input. I'm gonna lay down a select, and I'm gonna take touch zero two and. Then I'll just plug this into the math. So now I'm controlling it from my phone in a somewhat interactive manner. You're always at the mercy of Wi-Fi when you want to go Wi-Fi, but um, 
it's pretty quick to get your phone connected to touch. So. Um, no, I haven't figured out a way to do that. No, no, it's just on the Wi-Fi. Yeah, but uh, a lot of uh, applications like um, you know Rosalium uses OSC, uh, Reactor, uh, Ableton, all these things are going to use OSC, and in that case, I would definitely recommend using LAN uh, if you're doing an installation because Wi-Fi will always screw up on you when you least expect it. So, as we just demonstrated. <coughs> Okay, so um, and since we're on the topic of uh, devices and sensors, uh, the other things you can do with CHOP are also uh, DMX in and out. So DMX is a protocol for uh, lighting fixtures. It's used in you know, lighting rigging and stage work. Um, but also a lot of people use DMX uh, or ArtNet for LED control. So almost all the LED shows that you see with touch um, are using heavy DMX. Uh, uh, there's a installation called Scalar right now being shown at Craftwork, which is all touch designer, and that is all DMX um, for the lighting, but also for the winch controls, these winches that control um, the movement of uh, the things that are suspended, um, uh, is all DMX. So it's a widely used protocol and really good. Um, So I'm going to just uh, connect this guy back here. Another thing that I didn't show you yet, but if you want to replace a wire, you see I'm going to connect this in. The math shop, I can't just connect it there because it'll add a second input, but I can go over a wire and when that wire is highlighted, you can replace that wire with that connection. So that's a handy thing. And I just want to uh, slow this down. Thanks. All right. And in fact, I'm going to turn it off in the background because I want you to focus on the nodes. So let's talk about the last thing in chops that we haven't really addressed. Uh, there's tons of good chops to go through, but there's just too many to talk about. So the other thing chops do is audio. Um, if you think about what audio is, I'm going to drop down an audio file in chop. <clears throat> audio is really just a channel of samples. Um, the difference being it's it's sampled at 44,100 samples per second. That's like CD quality uh, sample rate, right? So in Touch Designer, we all also do our audio inside chops. So it kind of multitasks in this case. Um, it's just running at a different sample rate than most other chops, which are running at your project sample rate of 60 frames a second, all right? Uh, by the way, the, the project sample rate is set down here in the timeline. It says 60 FPS. And this FPS up here is the frame rate we're currently running at, almost 60, but it's a five-year-old computer, so whatever. Um, so the audio file in is just reading in a, a MP3 in this case. It could be a WAV or an AIF or whatever you want. Um, and uh, to make sound happen, um, you actually have to use an audio device out. The audio device out is gonna access your speakers or your, or the projector, since my audio is apparently going out through HDMI. Um, so the, here you can select the different devices. Um, here's my uh, speakers. Okay. Now, if you have um, if you have a outboard audio box, you would select it there. Um, you can also select ASIO if you want to use ASIO drivers here. Um, and uh, control the volume here, panning, whatever, regular stuff. There is a, a one thing to note is there's a buffer length. This is like uh, the audio buffer. And um, <clears throat> you do need to set it to something that is not inconsequential in touch because often there's so many things going on with the video engine that if you skip a frame, you're going to get a pop in your audio. So in this case, it's 0.15 seconds, which is a bit high for some audio pr processes. So um, you can drop that down if you're not dropping frames to maybe 0 0.05. But if you drop frames, you're going to hear it in your audio. So uh, it's something to think about. When we do uh, important installations where performance is, it can't make any weird audio sounds, we actually break the audio process in touch out into a separate TOE file so that 
all the video work you're doing, your interaction, your logic, isn't affecting your audio. Your audio is just a pure process. The other option is using a program that is designed for audio, like Ableton Live or Max MSP. Uh, those do have, like, just off-boarding the audio is sometimes a better option when you have heavy-duty video work going on, all right? So, something to consider. Um, but if you are doing audio in touch, let's just look at some of the other things you can do. Um, if you want to get a microphone in, uh, it's just the audio device in, and that'll just take the mic. Uh, as you can see as I talk, um, I'm getting audio in. And again, you can just select your device here if you have a capture card or an input uh, uh, audio box. Um, and there is a bunch of filters that can be used for audio. If I say insert operator here, all of these ones that are prefixed with the word audio are sort of specially designed to work with audio at the sample rate audio is imported in. So let's just drop down an audio filter and I'll make some sound here again. An audio filter is just, uh, it's just that uh, I'm going to turn it to frequency so you can see the frequency. And right now it's a low pass. So I'm just doing a low pass cutoff. I can change it to high pass, for example. You can add a little resonance if you want. Um, so some basic stuff. We also have um, we also have a uh, EQ. There's a param parametric EQ or a band EQ. Um, so maybe we'll just do a band EQ. Take the bass out. Blow my speakers up. Whatever. <clears throat> So what we could do here is actually, um, we could make a little audio analyzer really quickly, right? So let's try to do this. Um, it's just a good exercise. I'm gonna get rid of this audio band. And I'm just gonna have, uh, I actually don't need this audio device out either because I'm not gonna listen to this output. Um, I just wanna analyze these channels. So um, first of all, I have two channels, left and right, because it's a stereo, stereo um, file. So I'm going to add a math chop here, and I'm just going to add the channels together because I want to analyze them both as a sort of a sum. So adding is just the sum of the two channels. So I added an audio filter here, and I'm going to turn it to low pass. And um, now I want to do something called uh, analyze. So there's an analyze chop right at the top. And the analyze chop takes the channel input and it either does whatever function you set it to. So there's average, but uh, of note here for audio is RMS power. This is going to give you the RMS power of that channel. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the audio filter and set my low pass to about, uh, no, something like uh, 200 hertz. So that's... A little bit high for bass, but it's around bass. Um, and I see I have this, this it's hitting when the bass hits. Um, so I want to actually rename this. I don't like Chan 1. So I'm going to use a rename chop. And I'm going to rename this channel to low. Just low. Just so I know what I have. So let's do this for mid and high as well. I'm going to hold down shift and select all three nodes. And I'm going to copy and paste twice. OK. So for this middle one here, let's take, uh, let's go to band pass. Band pass is just uh, like this. It's in the middle. It's like a mid-range pass. And uh, I'll set that frequency to 800 hertz. It's approximately a mid-range give or take. And then I'm going to go to the rename chop and call this mid. And then the last one, I'm going to make it a high pass. And let's make it uh, a thousand. Uh, no, not a thousand, maybe 2000. Definitely not 200. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, rename, I'll just change to high. So I now have these analyzing chops giving me the low, mid, and high RMS power of this audio file. All right. 
So what I can do now is um, I'm going to add a merge chop. A merge chop is a simple chop that just takes channels from various chops and puts them together into one place. And there I have a, like a very quick audio anal analyzer, which I can then export these values to like colors or something else, um, the position of geometry, um, whatever you want. Um, if the range isn't good enough, you can use a math chop like we were before and change the range. Or perhaps maybe back here earlier in this math chop, you could go to the multiply page and use a multiply and this could be your gain. Because multiply, a gain is just a multiplying of the values. So, okay. What's that first math chop doing? The math chop I set, sorry, I didn't really explain what I did. I, I took the combined channel parameter and said add. So it's taking the two channels input and combining them. Yeah. So there's other ways of doing it. Like uh, if I had have taken this other input here and put it in, now I can use combined chops. This is going to take two different chops and I can add them together. So it's adding my microphone input to the audio now. All right. So a few different options here. Um, the math job has all sorts of goodies and it's, it's, a, it's so commonly used. You use it all the time to massage your values. So um, there's lots of good stuff in here. So um, that's pretty much it for audio. I'll show you, uh, there's a couple more nodes that are of, of interest. Um, the audio spectrum chop, if I just plug in my audio here, <coughs> This gives me um, basically an, a visualization of my audio spectrum, which can be used for creating lines, creating graphics, and stuff like that. It's doing an FFT on your audio and and getting the uh, you know the intensity of all the different frequency ranges. So uh, it's nice for visualizing. Um, if you, you're really getting into uh, using a lot of audio sources and mixing them together like you know you have a sort of a game system and there's all these sounds popping off and there's background track and there's a uh, voice coming in on your mic you might be interested in the audio dynamics chop um, that's because it has a compressor and a limiter built in so wait a second let me just connect that Um, on the compressor page, uh, you can turn on the compressor and just make sure things don't clip. Uh, on the limiter, if you have a whole bunch of things coming in together, you can well, you can just limit things from uh, blowing up speakers, etc. Uh, there's a bit of a post operation here, which allows you to fade in your mix and out your mix. Um, so for those that need compressors and limiters, it's there. And I think the other audio chop that you really need to know about is the audio movie chop because um, if you want to play the audio from one of those movies that we were playing earlier uh, you need to do it in chops right so let's bring in a movie from tops um, tops has no concept of audio so you can't just play out of a top it's just for 2d images so we'll lay down a movie file in top and I'm gonna go to one of the movies that I gave you guys uh, I don't know, I'll just pick any one. They all have audio, so it doesn't matter which one you pick. And then the audio movie chop is looking for a certain audio, uh, sorry, it's looking for a certain movie file in top. So I can just drag my movie to that parameter and it's pulling the audio out. And I can just drop down an audio device out. So there you go, you got some audio. Um, nice thing about this chop is it has, oh, that volume's not working. Um, the audio movie chop has this uh, audio sync offset parameter. So this is handy when you have like, a, uh, some HD movies have the audio offset because it wasn't encoded properly. You can just fix that easily with this. Or if you're finding there's a little bit of sync offset, you can just adjust that. Um, right now it's set to a default of 0.15 because you'll remember our audio buffer is 0.15. So it's matching up with that buffer. So you hear at the same time as you see. So that's why the default is negative 0.15. 
Um, so any questions about audio? It was a crash course of audio, but... Um, can you work with VST or audio unit external plugins? No, not in touch, no. Okay, I'm just going to uh, kill this audio. Stop this from playing. Yeah. Could you explain how to uh, separate high, mean, and... Uh, sure. So I just copied and pasted the low, but um, in the audio filter, the filter parameter is basically what you want to look at. It has low pass for your low end and band pass for your mid and high pass uh, for high. It also has band reject, which is the opposite of a band pass. So if you want to take out something, you can say, take out everything around this frequency, and it rejects those frequencies, um, if that's helpful for you. Um, a what? You can analyze the audio and make your beat detection in, in chops. We don't have uh, a beat detector chop, per se. Um, uh, but uh, I've seen many built in touch. <laughs> so yeah, you, you kind of have to build that looking at your RMS value and then finding peaks. And then you count your peaks per minute. So it's all math, which you can do in chops. So um, in fact, I think if you looked on our forum, up here in the top, there's a forum button. Uh, if you search forum for BPM detection, you'll find two things. I think you'll find an example from a long time ago that sort of works, and you'll find a lot of people complaining there's no beat, to t <laughs> beat job. <laughs> so, so look through our forum and find, uh, and find what you can. But I think there's an example there that does uh, some rudimentary beat detection. Another thing, though, is uh, if you're using something like uh, Tractor or Ableton Live, those things have really good beat detectors, and you can OSC that value in, so it's probably more functional. Is there a global tempo chop in order to make your session follow? So down here in the uh, in the timeline settings, there is tempo, which is default uh, at 120, and there's your timing signature of 4-4. Four, four. You can even change your timeline here over to beats if you're really working in beats. Um, and there is a chop called the beat chop which is then synced up to this tempo, okay? And it gives you ramps, um, let me just see. It gives you ramps or a count or BART and beats, all right? So you can then use these chops to run things anywhere in your system. Um, if you're using Ableton Live, you wanna use the Ableton Link Chop because you're just syncing right to, right to Ableton. And, and link is linking the touch designer session with Ableton. And there's a tool we have called TD Ableton, which is an, an entire environment that works for syncing channels and track data and song data. Um, actually, Ivan designed it, and he's giving a workshop tomorrow about TD Ableton, um, which he's going to go in depth on how to use it. So it's tight. So I'd recommend checking that out. So, um, Let's move on to uh, just a preview about SOPs because uh, we want to talk about 3D, which we haven't talked about yet. And um, I'm going to lay down a Taurus SOP again and zoom in here. And I just want to show you a few things about working in this viewer. Um, so if you make that viewer active, you can obviously uh, tumble and uh, zoom. But uh, more importantly are the options that you have here for looking at your geometry. So I'm going to open this by right clicking. I'm going to open display options and uh, <clears throat> here I can turn on things like uh, my points so I can actually see where every point of the of the topology of this torus is. Um, if you need to look at the point numbers because you're inspecting something, you're like uh, 0.494 is bad or something, you can look at the numbers. And uh, there's also normals. Um, for those that don't know, normals are, uh, they point out perpendicularly from the face of a polygon. So if this is my polygon, a normal it would be pointing at 90 degrees out from it. And this is used by the rendering engine for lighting calculations, because you need to know which way you're facing to know how to light your geometry. Okay? So 
that's one thing to know because sometimes if you import geometry that you downloaded off the internet or from another application, maybe it wasn't, normals weren't include, included for some reason. And um, that can be a pain. So uh, you can always add normals. Um, in fact, I'll show you how to do that. In the attribute create top, you can, all this, uh, the attribute create just does normals and tangents. So if you need to add normals to your geometry, um, there you go. The easiest way to know if you're missing normals is when you light it, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look lit or it's lit incorrectly or from the inside or something. That means you don't have normals in your geometry usually. So um, the other thing about uh, this is uh, wireframe, which is, as I said earlier, is W. Um, often you need to use wireframe to inspect your geometry to see what's going on. Um, you can also look at your UV coordinates, which this doesn't have UV coordinates, so you can't. Anyway, these are all the different display features of the um, SOP viewer, okay? So let's uh, just drop down another one called a sphere SOP, which is um, a sphere, a 3D sphere. Now, um, I chose this because uh, it is a good indication of different primitive types. We have uh, a few different types in touch. We have um, mesh, which is the default. We also have NURBS, which are, are beautiful and smooth, but they're very uh, intensive for the CPU to calculate. So for real time, we don't use them too much uh, if you're animating them. Uh, but if it's a non-animating surface, you can use NURBS. And then there's Polygon. Now, you can't see too much of a difference here, but if I make it wireframe, you can see that a mesh is made up of quads and a polygon is made up of triangles. So different ways of working here. Um, Sometimes uh, one will be lighter than the other. If you inspect it, you can see how many points you have and how many uh, polygons you have. And one thing to consider when you're working in SOPs is all the SOPs are calculated on the CPU. So uh, when you increase your point numbers uh, and you start animating things, it will slow down a bit. So something to think about. If you want to know how long something is taking to calculate, uh, every operator has this uh, CPU cook time here. So if I look here, this one up here is 0.83, this one here is 2.4 milliseconds, and that's how long it took to cal calculate that node. Um, if you're running at 60 frames a second, you only have 16 milliseconds to get all your work done. You can think of that as your budget. You have 16 milliseconds and everything you do is spending some of that budget because you don't want to drop frames. You want to try to say it's 60, um, if you can. So um, I'm going to just add a couple of operators here. So um, transform is obviously something you do a lot in 3D space. Transform just means moving, rotating, and scaling. Um, so here, you know, I can, I can move it in space um, or rotate it, which you won't see with a sphere, so that's a bad example or I can scale it, you know, in, in any uh, axis. Now, this is where using the label here for the value ladder is really handy because you can scale all three axes the same. Um, so that's handy. So I'm just going to make this a funny shape by just bringing this down a bit and maybe a little taller. Okay. And I just wanted to show you what you can do with a merge chop here. And in this case, we also have, not a chop, sorry, merge sop. Um, yeah. So, uh, with transforming uh, already uh, like an object, bringing some point of pixelation uh, in comparison to transforming it directly from the sphere uh, top. So, if we zoom a lot in the transform uh, yeah. top, Yeah, I mean, if you're zooming, you, you don't want to, yeah. I, so you're saying like moving the camera in, because we haven't talked about rendering, but moving the camera in and moving it out. Um, it wouldn't really pixelate it, no. Uh, if you zoomed in on a render, it would pixelate it. But if you move the camera in, the 3D render will still render it as smooth as your geometry. However, if 
if I look at this geometry and I, I have a frequency like this, it's not a very smooth circle, right? So if you get closer, you'll see those edges. So you need to crank up the refinement on it. And then even still, if you get really close to it, you might start seeing those edges. Um, so it's a combination. Um, I'll show you though, when we start rendering it with a camera, uh, what it looks like when we're moving in and out and yeah. So an emerge, um, you'll see here now that I have an oblong shape, I can, I can rotate it on different axes. Like, uh, okay, maybe I want the Z axis here. So I can just rotate it like this. Now, if I merge two things together, I'm basically putting them together as one. Oh, I almost have Saturn there. Um, oh, you're putting it together as one object, and now you can transform those things together. Um, so if I added a transform down here and started scaling this, now I'm scaling them as one unit. Um, hold on a second. Now I'm scaling it as, as one unit, okay? So that's just a way of grouping things together to act on them as a group. Um, uh, that's, yeah, just it's handy to know. So another one that is super commonly used is a grid, um, because a grid can be used for anything. You could maybe make this as a virtual screen in your 3D space and put a movie on it, or a, it could be a ground plane. Um, it can be used for all sorts of things. Um, and like the noise chop and the noise uh, top, we also, of course, have a noise sop because we're noise freaks at Derivative. So here we have a noise sop that is just taking your geometry and, and using a noise pattern to move the point position. Now you'll notice here, though, that um, I have normals here. I can tell by middle mouse clicking, and I have this N, which means normals. And it looks like it's lit, but as this moves, I don't see the lighting working properly. And that's because all I'm doing is moving the point position. I'm not calculating the normals again. So this is a case where after I've animated it and moved it, I want to calculate normals again. So I'm going to use an attribute create and turn on normals. And then you can see, oh, now, now actually the lighting is working as well. So that's often something people don't notice with uh, adding noise to their geometry is that your normals are lost uh, just by moving the positions. Yeah. Can you ask Ivan, just because it's probably, probably... Uh, I have a problem that I'm adding the transform. It's getting very Sure, sure. Then I, the... Yeah. Nothing's connected to it. Just connect something to it. Uh, this one. It's a That's a the bug or something. Because right now it's an error, so it shouldn't be doing anything. Okay. Um, it's interesting, but it's it, it's no there's no data in there, so it's just it's getting something from somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you connect it, it should clear that, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, you can displace things with a noise op, and um, and that's you know sort of interesting. So um, maybe I could take my sphere op from before and wire it in, and see what it looks like. Okay, that's fine. I'm gonna delete this stuff from earlier. There we go. Well, sorry about that. So there's another uh, tip. Um, if you have something selected and you want to find out, remember I pr pressed home for homing everything, but I have that node selected and I want to jump to it. So if you press shift H, that's, it'll home right on the thing you have selected, which is really handy when you have a big network and you're, you've lost where you are. Um, uh, so anyways, uh, let me see here. So this noise is a bit um, aggressive. I'm just going to drop it down a bit. And maybe increase this a little bit. So if we look at the noise, um, why is it moving? It's, n it's not just a noise function, it's actually animating. 
and that is on the transform page here. And if I open the translate parameter, um, there's abs time.seconds. This is a Python expression, which is getting the time in seconds and just using that as an animation. So that's fine. I just find it a bit fast, so I'm going to multiply this number by 0.2 or something, or 0.3 maybe, and it's a little less distracting. Any Python expression can be put in here, so you can multiply things, divide, add, uh, add Python code in there. Um, we're not going to get into Python uh, today, really, but um, you don't need to become a Python expert to use Touch, but if you Google little things and learn a little bit about Python, you can do really cool things very quickly. So um, uh, it's a very easy language to pick up because uh, it's very readable, and uh, Google is a great resource because you can just Google any question and instantly get the answer. So, yeah. Any question? Um, you can you can sort of do that with blending blend shapes. So there is a blend SOP where you have uh, you know two inputs, and the thing is you need to make sure that both of those geometries have the same point numbers in topology, and then you can you can fade between those point positions. So you can't fade between a cube with 24 points and a sphere with 300 points. That that, that doesn't work. So yeah. Yeah. Which is the best question. Awesome question. So we do accept OBJ just as a simple format, but uh, FBX is really the, the best. Uh, FBX, you can import an entire scene. So you can do cameras, lights, textures, uh, animation. Also, uh, it's a good animation. Mm -hmm. you can, they, will, they will be imported as uh, separate chops, and then you can use a switcher to switch which animation is playing. Or we have uh, animation sequencing tools as well, which can sequence different uh, animations together. So yeah, FBX is the way to go. And if you have an XB FBX file, you can just drag and drop it. Um, or if you want a little bit more control over it, you can use the import, import file dialog, which, um, sorry, I don't have an FBX handy. But it'll give you options like you can check on and off lights and cameras and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Who am I talking to? I can't see. Oh, okay. Can you import Python libraries or is it just like basic? It is not, uh, yeah, it's not basic at all. You can do everything in Python. Um, Python 3.5.1 is what we're on. Um, so old 2.7 libraries do not work, but you can import libraries, you can access them, um, you can write uh, your own extensions to extend Touch Designer. Um, uh, if you really want to see how deep it goes, uh, every single <laughs> operator in Touch Designer is a Python class. All right. So if I look at the sphere stop here, and there's two helps here. This is the first help for general help. But if I go to the Python colored Python help question mark, I go to the sphere SOP class, which uh, is part of the SOP class. So you can get things like the number of points, the number of primitives, uh, vertex, you can get your bounding box, and then you have a set of methods. For example, if there's like a JSON library, parse JSON, you say import JSON and use that? Sure, yeah. So you can access SQL databases. Yeah, yeah. If you have any questions about really integrating th Python with Touch, uh, Ivan is a great person to ask. He's our Python guru. So um, yeah, all the development that we're doing uh, behind the scenes for UI and stuff is all Python based. So. Yeah. Instancing? Um, so instancing has to do with uh, geometry component, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, uh, and our instancing is on the GPU, so it's super fast. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll get to that now. We're just sort of in SOPs and in SOPs. You can copy things, but because it's on the CPU, it gets heavy quickly. So there is a copy SOP, but unless you're doing very minimal copying and it's a static thing, I wouldn't recommend use it. I, I would recommend using instancing. So I'll, I'll show you how to do that. 
Now, one thing I do want to show you here is um, um, uh, the facet saw because it's it's just a fun saw and it gives you that sort of low poly flat shaded look uh, a lot of people like. Um, so if you right click, add a facet saw. And there's this thing called unique points. And if I turn on unique points and then recompute my normals, what it does is it gives me this sort of flat shaded thing. So what's happening here is when I turn unique points on, let me just pause this and turn on wireframe. Every triangle here is sharing a point at these places. But by putting on unique points, it creates a unique point for every polygon. So every triangle has its own points. So then when I recompute normals, um, it gives that polygon a flat shade. It doesn't interpolate the lighting across it. So you get this sort of geodesic low poly, low fi look. So, um, so that just takes me to uh, rendering, um, which we haven't done yet. We're right now, we're just talking about 3D objects, and, and they're just raw, raw object in object space. So what we want to do is we want to render this stuff at some point. So to do this, um, I'm going to take you uh, to the component uh, family of operators, which we haven't talked about that much yet. Um, components, if you remember from the beginning of the, uh, of the workshop, is how you create new folders. So if I create a, a base, a base is the most basic component. And I can go inside this base now and I have a new network ready to create a new idea. But um, if you look here, these columns are uh, unique, uniquely uh, different categories. So panels, as I showed you earlier, is for control panels like sliders, buttons, and making UIs. And 3D objects here, um, these are for building 3D scenes and rendering. So like to render, you need not just your geometry, but you need a camera, you need lights, and uh, other things that you might want to constrain to. So all of those are held here. So let's just look at a geometry component. A geometry component allows us to render it. Um, if I go inside, it's, it's a torus. Okay, um, I'm not interested in this torus because it's boring, um, so I don't want this torus in here. Um, but I want to put this um, funky noise sphere into my geometry so I can render this. So there's a couple ways of doing that. If I go inside any component, um, what I can do is I can add uh, inputs and outputs on the component to, to pipe data in. So let's just do that and you'll see how it works. If I go to SOPs and select an in SOP. So now if I go up back up a level, you see that there's an input here for SOPs. Okay. So I can now <coughs> connect this. And if I go inside, it's now inside my component. Okay. And likewise, I can uh, also add a out, out SOP. And every family has these in and out operators because you could do this for chops or tops or dats. You can send data into a component, work on it like a black box, and then spit it out the other side. All right, so you can make like a plug-in basically or an effect. So if I go up now, um, I see that I now have an output connector on this node. And I could add another SOP and keep on going down the chain. So yeah. Yeah, I'm not much of a 3D guy, but um, so just to have a little bit uh, first components we've uh, noticed we've used to create the object that uh, animates, etc., is being rendered. So why would I need to render a job to render to render it again? Okay, so uh, rendering it, it technically this is rendering on the screen, yes, yeah. but we're not rendering it in the sense that uh, in Touch Designer when you render something, you're rendering it to, into tops, our two D compositing chain. Yeah. Okay, and we're not doing that yet. So we don't have a camera to look at our render. Like, let's say you're using Maya or Cinema 4D. You have a camera and lights, and you do an offline render. And if it's a big scene, you wait for a couple hours, and you come back, and it's done. So we want to do that at 60 frames a second with a real-time render in tops. And then we'll have it in our top chain on the GPU. All right. So to do that, 
what we need is we need this geometry component because what it does is it, it gives it gives this geometry a location in world space. Okay. So uh, you'll see on the first page of this geometry, it has these, the, uh, this X form page, which is translate, rotate, and scale. And this is placing this geometry in the world somewhere. Okay. Right now, this is just object space. It's just sitting, like this is just an object at zero, zero, zero. I can't really move it around the world in a scene, right? So by giving it a world space, now the renderer knows where it lives and it can render it. The other thing the geometry component does for you is it has a render page here, which allows you to apply material. So when you want a material, put something on your, you know, you can put a material on it. All right. So this is all fine and dandy. We have uh, it going into our geometry component, but we still don't see anything there. And that's because I, I missed one step. And on every SOP and geometry component, we have these flags for rendering and display. So I'm going to turn on the purple flag for rendering because I'm going to render this in a, in a minute or two with you. And I'm also going to turn on the display flag. The display flag just lets it be viewed in this uh, viewer. So if I go inside and turn off the display flag, you won't see it in the viewer. And this is, in this case, it doesn't make any sense to turn it off. But in some cases, you might have proxy geometry or you might have like a bounding box that you actually don't want to view, but it's in there doing something. So you can turn off the display of things or the rendering. I might have a, if I have a light in my scene, I don't want the light to be rendered, but I want to see it in my view. So this is how you control those things in a 3D scene. Okay, so this is ready to start rendering, but um, for every, uh, well, let's just actually, let's put down a render top because that is what is gonna do our rendering for us. So render top is at the bottom of the third column. And this is taking a 3D scene and rendering it into a 2D image. Um, now, what it's going to do is, um, well, there's a, there's a line going off into space here. And so I'm going to inspect this line. It's a data link, and it's saying it, geo1 to render1. So if I follow this up, there's something way up here from earlier. And I think it's from the default. It is. It's from the default. Uh, file that we started with and I don't want this to be rendered in my scene so you know what I'm gonna turn off the render flag there because that's just not what I want the other option you could have done is um, in this render top you can tell what geometry to render so instead of rendering star uh, asterisk is a wild card for everything just render everything you find as a geometry I could type in the name of this which is called geo2 and then it's just gonna render this guy all right, so you can do either or, control it with flags or control it with this parameter here. I could type in geo3 if I had a geo3 here and it would render both of them, etc. So uh, the thing you need for every render though is a camera. And in fact, there's a warning here if I middle mouse click on it, it's saying no camera component found. So obviously your rendering will be undefined. So let's add um, a camera component under components, we get, get a camera. Okay, so now we have a camera. Uh, we can see that our geometry is sort of there, but it's black. It's because space is very dark without lights. So we need a light as well. So we add a light component. Okay, and this looks very similar to this because the default position just happens to be the same. But um, we can move this light off in off to the side, say, and uh, maybe change the color to just show that it is in fact a, a real light. All right. Okay, that's cool. Um, I can copy and paste this and add another light and maybe uh, change its color and uh, maybe just move it to the other side of the object. So I'll translate it in minus direction of C. Maybe to you know, just move your lights around. Uh, no big deal there. Now, if you wanted to work on this in a 3D sort of environment, um, um, you can split your panes into two workspaces and have a 3D viewer on the right. Um, so 
Up here in the layout, the pane layout, I can select this horizontal uh, split. And now I have two panes to work in. This can actually be handy when you're working on this upper level and then you want to go inside and work on your geometry. You can do two things at once. But in this case, I was interested in showing you um, how to get a geometry viewer here. And this, this drop-down menu um, at the upper left of any pane allows you to select different types of viewers. So I'm going to select geometry viewer. And now I can see my scene and... Um, Wow, my lights are really far off in space, but um, so I can move these a little closer. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do it all over again just to start from scratch. So I went up here into the pane layout, and there is a bunch of different uh, configurations of your workspace. So this vertical split, uh, if you click it, it gives you a left and right. All right. Um, now, if you didn't, if you don't want this, uh, the right click, uh, the right, the right end here has this menu where you can close and split things again. Um, but for now, I just wanted to change this to Geometry Viewer, and then you can look around your scene and check out your lights. Maybe I'll. So the lights are a little small, but you can see the camera and the lights and everything. And, and I can still see that cube that from that original s stupid file from before. And that's because if I go up here, I left the display flag on, right? So it's going to be displayed in any viewer. If I turn it off, then I don't see it. So that's, that's better. OK. So that's just a, a way of interacting with things. And if you want, you can grab a light and um, let me just see here. If I grab this light here, I can press the W key. Or sorry, is it W? Not W. It is the E key. And then I can actually move this light. That's Sorry, T is for translate. And you can move the light around in 3D space. OK. Um, it is what it is. Uh, it's not a great view, a 3D viewer. It's pretty old, but it is what it is. It works. And you have to just uh, change it to uh, this select and transform mode to move things around. And you move, select, if you select the hand, then you can move this around again. So enough of that. It was just a preview to show you that that stuff is there when you need it. Uh, I'm going to close this by right, -cli uh, not right clicking, just clicking on this drop down menu and pressing close. Or you can also click this single pane layout here, and that works. Yeah, so now that it's rendering, we can export to a movie. Um, any top, actually, you can right click on and just say save image, and you can save a screen grab. That is just one. If you want to do a movie, there's two options for you. Um, there is a movie out top, which has all the gory details. Or if you want to do a high resolution, non real time render, like let's say you want to bump this up to 8K and do a rendering, then you can go to file and export movie. And this is a non real time rendering. Um, all you do is drag in this and set up your settings and then press start and go. It is based on the timeline. It's going to render on a timeline a certain length. So it's not for real-time rendering. Just, yeah. So um, I'm going to move a little faster to get through a few things here. So one thing we haven't done now uh, still is added a, um, a material, right? So. Materials are called mats, and um, I'm going to select a Fong material. So on the geometry component, if you go to the render page, um, just go to. Uh, you can drag your material to the material parameter, or you can type it in Fong one, and that works. And the material lets you control all sorts of things like. Um, OK, I can just control the diffuse color, um, right? 
or I could um, the specular color. Now, specular color is highlight. So when you have something, uh, maybe if I turn off my, my facet, you see this this highlight here, the word shiny. That's the specular color. So if I boost that up, you'll see oh, it's stronger or less strong. Or you can actually change the color from white to some yellow color or something. And right below that, there's a shininess parameter which controls you know how shiny it is. If it's like a flat rough surface or if it's a shiny plasticky surface. I'm going to back off the uh, the color of this and just make it gray again. So um, the other thing you can do is there's all these map parameters and these map parameters are for texture maps. So let's say we have a texture map which is uh, just a top, right? So let's go and get a top and we'll get a movie file in, which is at the bottom of the second column. And actually, a banana is totally fine for this example. I'm just going to drag the banana onto the color map. And you can see I have a banana now down here as my material. It's a deforming warped banana, but it is a banana. All right. Uh, maybe a movie is more interesting, so you can you can go in here and grab one of the movies I, gr I gave you and or any movie you have on your system and now you have a movie texture playing back on your 3D surface. Uh, great for abstract blobs of spheres but I mean it might make more sense if you had it on a grid and you were doing some like 3D visualization in your 3D world of these different screens you can map these playing movies to all these grids. right? Absolutely, yeah. The uh, the light the light here has a I think it's on the light page a projector map, and that takes a top, so that will shoot out your texture out the light there. Yeah, so you can do that to simulate a projector in your scene, or um, you can do that to actually texture things in very interesting ways. So I should say too that the light is where you control shadows, which are off by default, but if you wanted shadows in your scene, it's on uh, the lights, because for every light you need to turn on, uh, is, it a, is it a shadow casting light? Um, I'm not going to get into that though, because um, you can explore that on your own. So um, I'm going to remove that movie, I don't uh, need it for the rest of this, uh, I just wanted to show you that. <clears throat> Now, more interestingly, I want to show you uh, another material um, uh, called the PBR mat. Now, if we just put one down first, uh, under mat, find PBR. PBR stands for uh, Physically Based Rendering. Um, it's been around for a while, but it's actually new to Touch Designer 99, this version, so it's only been in touch for a year or so. Um, and Physically Based Rendering means it... it, it it looks at your environment, um, you set up an environment light that is uh, basically the lighting of your environment and it, it uh, samples that environment to see what the lighting looks like. And it also uses more physically based um, attributes in the material. So if you look over here on these parameters, there's things like metallic, roughness, uh, ambient occlusion, uh, and things like that which are more uh, about physical properties. Um, of the material. So let's just apply, um, first of all I'm going to take my lights and make them a little white, whiter so that I, we can see the colors for more of what they are. Um, so I don't know if you change your color, just knock down the uh, saturation a bit. Okay, that's fine. So what I'm going to do is apply this PBR material to my Fong and it instantly gets uh, dark uh, because it needs an environment light to actually work. So let's go under components and find environment light. It's right in the middle. And we'll add environment light. Now the environment light, there's some, some noise and junk going on, but the environment light doesn't do anything unless you have uh, an environment map. The environment map is basically, um, it's like looking at a sphere out in your environment. So if we had an environment map for this room, it would look like, a 360 sphere of this room and we the renderer would sample all the positions to find out your reflections and how it's lit 
So I, I included in the folder I gave you, um, under the media folder, uh, in the HDR subfolder, this uh, environment map image, which is an HDR image. It, I'm just going to drag and drop it in. And this is what's called an equal rectangular format. So the sphere has been spread out into a 2D image. Um, but you can also use, um, I think you can use, well, you can definitely use cube maps, um, which I don't have one for you. But there's a few different formats you can use. This is a common one, and it works well. So I'm going to select the environment light and just drag this image to the environment map. OK. So you'll see the warning went away on the light. Yep. For this? Yeah. My, my, my best friend is Google. Um, I just go Google. Um, and and wait a second. There is a really good one. Uh, da, 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 da. I wonder if I'll find it here. HDR HDRI Hub is pretty cool. Um, you can actually render your own in Touch Center too, which is yeah. Here's a whole bunch for download. These are all equal rectangular. But I would just Google it and find the best ones for you because they're going to be different resolutions, different whatever. You can buy them too if you got cash to burn. Um, a lot of places will sell you them. So, all right. So, um, so let's just look at this. The rendering. I'm going to turn it on in the background just so we can see what we're doing. And I'm going to select. Here, let's move this out of the way. Select my PBR. And now if I change the metallic, uh, okay, that doesn't do too much. You can see it looks a little bit more shimmery. But if I change the roughness, if I crank down the roughness, now I'm getting like a fully reflective. It's not rough because it's perfectly smooth geometry. Now I can see that environment map out in the outside, right? It's sampling this environment map. Um, now the metallic actually has more of a, an effect because a, a shiny metal is more common than a dull metal. To, I mean, or at least it works in this case a bit better. Somewhere in between there, you definitely get some soft looking metal. All right. So these parameters you can just kind of tweak and play with. Um, what's really interesting with PBR is actually going back to this facet and turning on the facet. And you get some really cool effects because you have reflection based on the position of those those polygons. So it's kind of uh, for for free, um, and it looks good. So. so the PBR is necessary right now. What you're doing? Uh, if you want reflections like this, you can do an environment map with a fong, but it won't look as good. So I'd use PBR for this. Um, there's some other advantages with PBR too, which I'll go to in a minute with uh, how to get realistic looking textures in Touch Designer. So um, I'm just going to go back and just crank up my crank up my sphere a little bit. There we go. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so the PBR material also has uh, all these other the pages that are on the Fong, but it has this maps page where you can put in your own maps for metallic, roughness, base color. And most interestingly is this one here called the Substance Top. So we have a top called the Substance Top that is special for substance materials. So I want to show you this. It's a new feature, and it's really how you can get some realistic textures into touch. So if we go to Tops and look for Substance, We get substance here, and I'm just going to put it here beside my material. And all I need to do is drag it and drop it into that substance top parameter. OK. So what's going on here? The substance top is, um, if I select it, you can look at the uh, graph here. And there's a bunch of different materials that are included here. So I can select, the simple one is just a default, but I can select concrete and get some sort of a concrete looking thing. 
Now, one thing to note is when the substance top comes in, the default for it is pretty low resolution. It's only 256 by 256. And if you go to the common page, you can see that. So I'm going to bump this up to maybe 512 by 512, and you just get a much nicer looking concrete. It's still a little shiny for concrete because of uh, these parameters. So I'll put these back to one. That means that all of these uh, maps that's included here, which are the metallic map, the roughness map, the ambient occlusion and normal maps, all of them are going to be full contribution because this is now taking care of the material. So when you use a substance top, you can start with all these at max one. Um, if I go back to the setup page of the substance top, I can change to uh, you know metal. Um, this, these are just default ones that we included with touch. Um, and for each of these, you can go to the input values and check out um, uh, the input. These will actually change how the material looks. So maybe uh, concrete isn't good. I'll go to... Oh, that's a problem. Hold on a second. Okay, metal's now working, I think. Yeah, maybe. Actually, that's not working. All right. I'm at, okay, that's changing to check. This is not updating for me. I don't know why. I'm sorry about that. Oh, there we go. For some reason, I have to just press... Now it says checkers. Okay, strange. Um, so checkers is a fun one. It's just a, a checker pattern. Um, now, if I go back to metal, maybe I can get where I'm trying to go here. Yeah, so in this case, um, I can control the dirtiness of the metal, make, make it more shiny, and make it uh, a little more rough or more shiny here. You can really control all of these colors. Now, these input values can't be animated in real time because what it's doing is it's actually recalculating these PBR textures. So it has to recalculate six times all those textures. Um, but th that's fine. That's not the purpose of these. These are really to set up a material and to get in realistic materials, materials from other applications. Um, now, why it's called the Substance Top is because it's actually taking um, a material file from a different application called Substance Designer, and I don't know who is familiar with that, but um, it is a material, uh, a material authoring software, as you can see there, heavily used in the gaming community and other real-time, um, other real-time, uh, you know, workflows. Um, but basically, it's a material editor, and it's node-based as well, so it's pretty fun to use. Um, and what authors of these materials can do is um, all of the parameters that they use to create this, all the adjustable parameters for the material, when you export them from here and load them into the substance top, all of those things show up here. So you can interactively change your material without having to go back to Substance Designer. You can just change them here. Now that's why they're not real time. They're using the Substance Designer SDK in the back end to recreate textures. So unfortunately, you can't animate them, but uh, unless they're maybe very small resolution. But um, the point is, you can get amazing looking realistic textures from uh, Substance Designer and the community. Um, they have um, a community here called Substance Share for free and Substance Source for buying. So, for example, I'm going to go to Substance Source here, and if I can remember my login. Okay, Substance Source. Okay. And there's a couple of free ones in the source, and then I'll show you um, at the Substance Share, there's hundreds of free ones. So if I go to free assets here, these are all um, just a couple that they tease you with so you can buy all these ones for money. Um, but uh, let's just go and get uh, Iceland Grassy Cliff. Fine, that's great. Uh, shit. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, so where did this go? I'm just going to show it wherever it downloaded, and I'm just going to um, 
drag and drop it in. It drops down as a substance top. All right, right from the website Substance Designer, you can output, export these as well. You'll notice this is a very complex one. It has how many different layers there? Quite a few. Um, we support about eight or nine of those layers. So there's a couple here that we probably don't support yet, but uh, that could change in the future as we improve the SDK. So I'm just going to drag and drop, uh, sorry, I'm going to select this, look at the maps folder and drag and drop this into here. Okay, let's, let's uh, turn off, let's turn off some of this stuff just so we can look at what we have here. So uh, it's low res because it comes in at 256 by 256, but let's make it pretty by jumping it up to 1024 by 1024. Okay, so it rendered all those things. And um, I'm just going to, you don't have to follow me here. I'm just going to make this spin, uh, this camera spin here. And I'm going to rotate this. Okay, sorry for that. Um, just wanted to get some rotation going on my camera. So here I have this, um, I guess this Iceland rocky cliff. Um, and if I go to input values, uh, I, these are all of the parameters that the author had included in this material. So if I, I don't want any mud here, I can take the mud and put it to zero. And it gets rid of the mud after it recreates all those textures. It's taking a little bit of time on my computer because it's doing all 16 or 12 of these textures and uh, my computer is five years old, so sorry about that. Um, but I can uh, maybe increase the growth amount to 0.9 and you'll see that there should be a whole bunch more of this grassy stuff or there's more of that grassy stuff. Okay. Um, you can control the height, you control the glossiness, you can control any settings that the author wanted you to control. So. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, now, there wasn't that many here that were for free. Um, so if I show you the, uh, the other site that they have under content, oh, come on. Okay. So under their content tab, they have a second one called Share, which is uh, basically their community. Um, and if you go to materials here, there's 858 of them. And 80% of them have uh, SBSAR files, which are the files we need. So I'm going to click on rating to get the best ones at the top. OK. Um, we can pick any of them here, but let's just take uh, marble, whatever. Wow, they don't have a single sign-on system. OK, so let's see where this went. Just going to excuse me while I extract. So here, um, they should have an SV. They do. They have an SBS file, which is if you actually owned Substance Designer as well, you can go in and edit it. I can drop down this marble. OK, it's a simple one. Sorry about that. but. Let's drop it on, see what it looks like at least. Okay, it's a bit low res, uh, so again, I would have to go in here and crank up that resolution to make it look a little nicer, but I mean, you're getting materials for free here, and, and, and we are a small team. We didn't have time to make 500 mats in our thing, so we decided to support uh, this, this uh, protocol, or I guess this this application and the community there is uh, very vibrant so um, uh, we think you can find a lot of great looking materials from them so yeah um, I come from a 3D writing background and I have a couple of questions regarding the materials I don't see any uh, subsurface scattering any the, no the, the first thing is is a bump or uh, so yeah so anyway. we have bump in the fong so we have a bump right here normal map and bump uh, we don't have subsurface scattering, 
So if you wanted to do that, um, uh, there is also in materials uh, GLSL mat. So you can make your own GLSL shaders. Oh, that's cool. it, yeah. So uh, you can make awesome stuff in GLSL. However, it, it is real time. So some of the stuff you might be familiar with in 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 3D, like uh, non real time rendering, mm -hmm. is a little impossible to do in real time. Some of yeah, it you can, course. but yeah, you, yes, you know what I'm talking I'm, about. I'm thinking displacement is a long way down. I mean, yeah. it's, it's going to be hard to integrate it in real time, right? Some things, yeah. Uh, no, no, displacement no. you can do Displacement yeah. you can do in GLSL. Yeah, okay. no problem. And there's actually some really good examples on our forum of displacement uh, components. Okay. So I'd check it out. Um, actually, also here in the uh, folder I gave you, I think I included it in the extras folder, uh, noise displacement. This is a GLSL, GLSL guy I did for our GLSL introductory course. So this is GLSL displacement, and this is a million <coughs> points in this grid, so it's super high res. Um, and and very beautiful. So yeah. you can do stuff like that on on the GPU. Yeah. So uh, another question was um, maybe uh, import some materials besides SBS from other 3D packages. So we don't have any support for that. It's just Substance Designer, and it's actually a pretty new feature. It came along when we did PBR. So it's been around for a year and a half. So okay. we've just started there. Yeah. So. You can quite easily convert GLSL shaders you find in like Shader Toy and stuff into yeah. Touch Designer. Mm -hmm. You can five to ten minutes, you can get almost all shaders working. You just yeah, have to yeah. change a few things. So. So that's the workaround. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just gonna export my maps and just gonna create yeah. GLSL. So. so the other thing is, if you're coming from uh, Houdini or another thing, that's why we expose all these maps here, right? Yeah. So all these maps, you can you can yeah. render out all your passes. And one more thing that's very interesting is that, let's say I go, okay, this guy here. If I don't like the way that uh, one of these is working, uh, let's say I don't like the way that the color is, right? I can use a substance select top. Okay. So I isolate the, the one that I Just the one channel, okay? So this is my base color. And now I can use tops to totally do whatever I want. Yeah. So I can do like, um, oh, let's see if I can HSV adjust this and uh, change the saturation and change the color like this. All right. Yeah. And now I want to put this back into the base color, override the base color. Boom. Yeah, so you can do all that on the GPU, pull it out and then do some top work and then bang it back into the material. It's super useful alongside the, the, the gig or something like yeah. that. Yeah, you don't you don't have your 3D Especially or time. your Photoshop artist with you. Yeah. You know you can come in there and do a little tweak and yeah. Uh, so. I noticed uh, this is the last one. I noticed uh, uh, Lumia's channel. Uh, I think in the phone, uh, you can use that to light your scene with other objects, right? I Just don't. Light bulbs, let's say. We do not have self-illuminating <coughs> objects, no. You'd have to use a light right now to fake it, unless you did it in GLSL, and then you can illuminate anything you want. So there's a couple examples Matt Regan has in our forum of a system where he's built, he has all these lights, but they're actually little spheres, little globes that are all emitting light, but they're technically GLSL lights, and they're floating around and okay. doing that thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So how, I mean, your frames are not dropping to about 30, 35, yeah. which is impressive. Mm -hmm. But uh, how would you compare in, in performance-wise GeoCell versus uh, Substance uh, shaders? Uh, it depends on how good your GLSL code is, first of all. <laughs> but um, the PBR is definitely a heavier material than the FOM, yeah. for sure. If you're doing PBR-like stuff in your GLSL material, you're not going to get any faster because I'll show you, like, all of our shaders are actually GLSL. Yeah. So. If I take this Fong material, whoops, or the PBR, but if I take the Fong material and I want to know the GLSL code and I want to start editing it myself and tweaking it, yeah. you can select it and you can go to Output Shader. You can go to Output Shader and then select OK. It creates a GLSL mat for you with all the code. Yeah. This is the code that we have in here. All right. And what's really powerful about it is that if, if I 
if I say, have, I've put a movie on here, so I have a color map here, yep. and I have a, a, a bump map here, and all this stuff connected, yeah. and then I output it, the code is going to include all, right. all of those inputs already, all those sampler inputs, so you don't have to learn how to bring in an input, you can learn just by experimenting like that. Yeah. So, um, it's a great way of learning how to use GLSL in, in touch. And if I did the PBR one, it would have all the gory PBR equations in there too. Yeah. So you could go in there and tweak it yourself. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so to answer the question, all of our materials are GLSL. Yeah. They're just uh, wrapped in a parameter thing. So. Yeah. And I am sorry that my laptop is so old, but um, I'm running a whole bunch of movies right now and rendering and PBR mats and not optimizing anything. Yeah. So. And as a, well, just a follow-up question. How can you do that the other way around? So can you make, like, sort of uh, containers that you can use afterwards in different projects? Yeah. Just by selecting it in POS or whatever? Yeah. Um, so uh, let's do that now, because um, I kind of was leading into that anyway. So. Um, Give me 30 seconds. Yeah, just 40, 45 seconds. So I'm going to go back to this thing here and uh, remove. I'm sorry I messed this all up here. Okay. And I'm going to go back to my funky. Yeah, Ivan? Let me just do a clean up here, just so I can see where I'm at. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, because I was explaining a lot of things there. So I think your question was, how can I make this into a container and 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 continue to to use it as like a black box or something you can use in another project? So this is a bit of a big project to do it with because it has all the rendering, but I'm going to do it anyway because whatever. Um, so what I can do is I can select all of this stuff, right? So I want to put all this this rendering of this little crazy sphere um, into a component, okay? So if I select all these operators and right click on the network somewhere, there's an option to collapse your selected. So I could just cut and paste, but I can just collapse this selected into a base component. And now I have everything inside there, right? So let's go inside. Um, same thing as before. What I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna add an out top uh, right here, so that now I have a little output here, right? And when I look at it, okay, now I can see this view in here. Yeah. So this is actually because on the common page it's looking at out one inside. So there's a little, little thing to that. But the point is here, I'm going to call this, uh, whoa, I don't want to go inside there. I'm going to rename this to um, facet cube uh, sphere. All right, so now I can right click on this. Not only can I copy and paste it and maybe change the other one's color, materials, whatever. I mean, do whatever you want with it. Um, I can right click on it and say save component TOX. Yeah. So TOX is our file format for a component, right? So I'm gonna save it right into my folder here. So now I can I can be working in another area entirely, let's say in here in a world, totally different different project. I can go back to my um, file. Here's the facet sphere TOX, drag and drop. Okay, so right. there you go. Also, um, if I can, f uh, okay, let me just open this. The size of this, because it's all procedural, is tiny. It's 4K. You can email this, send it in IM. You can send it easily. So there's no, I'm not including the movie in there or the image. This is just the procedural part. So uh, it's easy to send across to other people. Is there like a, like a global user folder where you can put them so they are uh, addressable through the UE? Or, uh, um, I would uh, start my project by saying create project folder. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you would have to send people the assets if you're, you, you transfer a whole project over, not just the file. Yeah? Is, is there a way to compile all used assets to an exported folder? 
Um, you mean go through the file, everything, and, and no, there's not like you go gather everything and bring it in? No, no. I recommend when you're starting a project to create a project folder and have an assets folder or a media folder. And in fact, when you do say create project here, uh, we prompt you for the ones that you might want, like movies, images, geometry, audio, and you just turn on these if you think you're going to use them in your project and it'll create the folders for you to make it easy. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of self-management involved in using Touch Designer. Yeah. One, one last question. Yeah. Once you create a component like this, is there a way to expose certain parameters, like the number of facets? Give me 45 seconds. <laughs> so that is uh, the exact thing I wanted to uh, show you. Uh, we have all these parameters that we've included, right? Um, um, but what if you want your own custom parameters? And you asked also, like, how do I change the range of something from 1 to 10? If it's, if, if it's 0 to 1, how do you change it to 1 to 10, right? Uh, so any component that you make, um, you can add something that we call custom parameters. You can customize it to your heart's content. So for this one, let's do that, and let's maybe control, I don't know, the color or the rotation speed or, or something like that. So if you right-click on any uh, component, there is a customize component uh, option which will open up this component editor, all right? So um, in this little dialogue here, uh, there's just a few things you gotta get started with is, the first thing is adding a page. These are referred to as parameter pages. So we wanna add our own page. So I'll just give it a name, like controls, because I'm not being too creative right now. And I click add page, and now you can see I have a new page there of parameters, right? So the first one uh, I'll say is, uh, what do I want to do here? Um, let's do the amplitude of the noise. So I'm going to call this parameter noise amp. And then in this dropdown is the different types of parameters that we have in Touch Designer that you might want to use. Uh, by default, it's a float, uh, which is just a floating a float slider, floating number being anything with a decimal. Um, there's also an uh, int, or if you wanted to specify a chop there, or perhaps colors. Let's just do a float here and add parameter. Now, sometimes this happens where it doesn't refresh here. I've seen this, and my computer seems to be a little finicky today. So if you toggle that, it will show up. Just I just press P to toggle it, and it refreshes. I haven't figured out why it does that on my machine, but if that happens to you, you can just toggle. And this noise amp is 0 to 1, but let's make it 0 to 2. So down here, I can go and change the uh, norm max to 2. And now my slider is 0 to 2. All right. Um, you can also clamp things so that even if people overdrive it like this to 5 or 6, you can give it an upper limit by turning on clamp. Um, but uh, whatever. Uh, you can set them up basically any way you want. So let's also add uh, another one. Let's call it color. Uh, no, let's call it light color. And I'll, I'll maybe set this to the color of one of my lights inside. And I'll select an RGB parameter because it's going to be red, green, and blue parameter and add it. And this is the same color parameter you're going to see all over touch and if you click on this swatch you get the same color picker and everything. It's the exact same parameters that you see us use in our in our default stuff uh, for custom parameters. So now we have these parameters we got to go inside our network and sort of tie them together because you might be a technical director and making this for the artist to use and they're just going to use all these parameters. They're never going to go inside and build it. They're just going to use it and, and set up a scene let's say. So you're going to go inside and, and set, up, um, set up your system for them. So to get these, uh, these parameters here inside, um, you can go to chops and we have a parameter, if I can spell parameter, parameter chop. If I look at this, it's giving me the noise amp and my red, green, and blue channels from that parameter. All right, so I'm going to export these to all the places I need. So I'm going to use a null chop, as we always do whenever we export. And down here uh, on my noise, this is the noise. So here's the amplitude right here. This is the... Okay, so I'm going to take that channel, noise amp, and export it here. Okay. 
And then these color channels, I'm going to, uh, let's go back and control one of these lights, the light color here. So I'm just going to take the red to the red contribution of the light and the green to the green and export all three channels here. And just to make things more obvious, I'm going to turn off my other light. Actually, I'll just delete it so we just can see what's happening here. So it's black now. You're not seeing any contribution from that. The lighting you're seeing now is that PBR environment light. But let's go back up a level and start controlling this and seeing how it works. Like, okay, so my slider is working from the top level. Don't got to go inside. Don't have to remember where everything is. You can set it up and just forget about it. And in my color, I can, uh, let's, let's bring this up. Okay, this kind of a hot spot there. If it's white, you can see that. Now I am rotating the camera around, so, and also this is a shiny object. So, it's not the best demonstration of this. If I were, sorry, if I were to put a fong down and blow away that, I'm just going to select that material there. Now you can see the color of the light changing better, all right? The PBR adds a lot of environment light to it, so it's a little hard to visualize. You could only see the highlight changing. But the point is, is now I'm changing the color of the lights from this custom parameter on the outside. And they can use this as a black box from this top level and they can export to these or control these with a sensor or a MIDI device or whatever. They're, they're, um, they're real parameters. So. You could change uh, files as well? Uh, for which one, sir? Well, let's say you wanted to change the movie that's acting as a Yeah, so uh, I see. So customize parameter and let's go and just say file. We'll look for file. Okay. Right. Now, maybe uh, this is actually getting a file from outside. Um, just to make it easier for me uh, here. Sorry. I could also add um, top and just make it a top. And here, then, if I had a, a, a movie like the uh, famous banana here, I could add it to here, like that. Okay. When you, when you do that kind of drag and drop, like the parameter linking that you just did, yep. are those things like dynamically linked, or is it just taking the values at that time? Here? Stuff, yeah. Like if you were to make a change to the banana later, <coughs> would that flow through? Yeah, so. Right now, it's just using the name of this operator. So one thing that if I change the name, it's actually going to say, hey, you're changing the name and it's being used somewhere. Do you want to change it? And then I say yes. Um, but if I change what's here, it's fine. It, like if I put it in a different movie or image, yeah. It's just using, yeah, it's just exactly. Okay, so if I was to, any, any nodes, like let's say I have a banana and I'm going to make a, uh, a pink filter, which is basically going to take, make pink bananas, all right, and I'm going to put an out here. So if you select them all and then right click on the network somewhere, you can say collapse selected. And then... I have my pink banana filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would be the difference between a base and a container? Uh, so base uh, base components are the most basic <laughs> basic yeah. component with no real uh, uh, settings. Yeah. The containers are a panel type. So all these panels are for UI building, and a container will have a size, and then you can put other panels in it. So if you were to make um, if you were to try to recreate this in Touch Designer, yeah. I'd start with a container big enough to hold these two rows of knobs and these buttons, yeah. and then I would add these buttons and knobs inside that container. <coughs> oh, all right. All right? Yeah. So containers, uh, I mean, all those panels there in this have a bunch of values such as, uh, are you clicking on me? 
are you rolling over me? Where is the mouse cursor on top of me? Because it's all based on interaction. All right. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, uh, let me just put this back on here because I like this better. In fact, in the folder I gave you, there's a bunch of examples here from our other workshops. If we had two days together, we'd go through a lot of these and build them, but there's one called Movie Select. And in Movie Select, let me just stop this from calculating. Um, I'll open this a second and just show you what's possible with, with these panels because um, it's a really it's a good exercise. And in fact, on our tutorials uh, website uh, or web page, um, there's a video tutorial of this movie select going through it and how to build it. So, um, okay, so this movie select here, uh, I have to specify a folder. So what I'm gonna do is go to my movie folder, select this, and this is a folder dat. This is looking at that folder and getting all the movies out of it. And it's taking the name and the path. So this folder dat gets all sorts of information. We just need the name and the path. And this is a dynamic system, so it automatically loads every single movie in here uh, into these components. And this looks complicated, but I can build this with you in an hour if we had another hour, all right? And, and the workshop video is only an hour long and you'll get through it and voila. So if I go up here, it's been laid out as a container here. So if I view this, it's a floating window. As I roll over it, they give you a little preview. As I click on it, it selects it for the output of this guy into a main viewer, right? So I have a viewer here and a movie bin. And if I go up another level, I set them up here like a control surface, right? So I put my viewer on top of my things. And if you have a different folder of images or movies, you can just point to that and it'll dynamically load them all. And you can just click, click through them. So, yeah. I want to do that right now because we only have half an hour left. So it's basically, yeah, I'd like to do that now. So it's a, it's a good, good time. Um, there's one more thing before we get onto that uh, is, is about optimization. Why is this not playing forward? Okay, there we go. This only takes a minute, so I'll go through it. If you go to dialogues and go to performance monitor, um, this thing is uh, helpful for finding out what is slow in your system. And you see that I'm at 40 frames a second, so I'm dropping frames. If I click Analyze here, it tells me everything that happened that frame, and I can see what happens, uh, what takes a lot of time. Um, so it's a little bit gory, but if you look up here, it's like, okay, uh, this facet stop is taking a long time, and this noise stop is taking a long time. So these guys here are kind of offenders, they're kind of taking a lot of my frame rate. So I might try to do that in a different way or I might try to reduce the number of points or something like that. Um, but you can really find out where the problem is in your file with this dialog. Even more cool way of doing it um, is something that Greg built, um, Greg's CEO and president of Derivative. Uh, it's in the palette, so I'm gonna reopen the palette which is this icon here under, underneath file. And under tools, <clears throat> he has something called probe. I'm going to drop probe in here. It takes a little while. It's a bit of a big system. Okay. So probe, um, to open probe, once you have it in your system, it's just control P. Now this is a visualization of my entire project. I'm currently at the root. Okay. So... If I just move this over here and uh, maybe I'll just do this. Can I do this? Here, so I'll go to the home here. I've got a lot of stuff going on here, but you'll see that these nodes are in the same position. See those three nodes match up with this, right? So if I click on this one and go inside the container component, uh, there's my, there's what we were doing this morning. If I go inside project one, this is, this is there, right? Okay, 
So you can see that, wow, down here, I'm really, this base comp down here is really killing my performance. So if I move down here, where is that? Sorry, it's kind of hard to do with two windows, but um, this base comp is killing my performance, and that's because I have this guy in here, right? So let's click on that again and click on in the inside. So inside, it again tells me the noise sop, attribute create, and facet sop are, are kind of the biggest offenders, right? And this is a really fast way of just kind of identifying the problem areas. Now these ones that aren't cooking means that they had a very high cook time, but they're not cooking every frame, so it doesn't matter. It's just when I first laid it down, or maybe it calculated once because I changed the parameter, it, it took a while, but they're not cooking every frame, so it's fine. What's this one here? Another container comp. Uh, this is the probe itself. So now I'm probing the probe, which I don't know if that's legal. Yeah, okay. That's inside the probe. So anyways, uh, it's a good tool to remember. Um, where did I put it? Here. I'm going to remove it now. It does use up a little, a little bit of time, but it's a good thing to quickly find out where you want to optimize your file. So. So let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about how we actually want to output this to a projector. Um, I'm going to go way up here to the to the very root of my project, and I have a couple things here. Um, I have my project here, and I'm going to import uh, another facet sphere because I love this guy. It didn't, no, I didn't have it, so I have to resave it because uh, we saved it before I had those things. No. Yeah, good point. So let's just uh, talk about how to set up parameters and, uh, sorry, pr not parameters, but uh, components for a projector. Um, the first thing you really need to know about is uh, the window component. <clears throat> now, the window component. Uh, is down here in the in the bottom of this other param, uh, other list, but we include one for you in every uh, touch designer file at the root, and it's called perform. So if I select this, you'll see it's actually a window component here. Um, so right now it is currently looking at project one. So that's fine. It's looking at this thing. So I'm going to let me just change this. Here. So if I, let's just walk down the parameters here and find out uh, how it works. So right now it's going to open on a single monitor and it's going to be monitor zero. So what that means is if I go to a Windows and I right click on the desktop and select display settings. If you had multiple monitors here, like if I had a projector connected, it would show up over here. And the leftmost monitor, the one most to the left will be monitor zero, and then one, two, three, and four. You can disregard the numbers that Windows uh, supplies, like one, two, and three. They do not matter. It's basically the left to right is how they are enumerated in Touch Designer. Um, and that keeps you from having to worry about if someone puts their second monitor on the right and whatever. It's left most is always monitor zero. So we'll go back in here. Um, that's fine. I want to open it like that. Now, down here in the, uh, if there's this DPI scale, you have to worry about that. Um, you can use native or DPI scale. So if you're on a retina monitor, that might come into consideration. But for projectors, you're usually not worrying about DPI scale, so forget about it. Opening size is going to be taken from automatically here. Um, so if I select this project and I look at the layout, it has a size. It's 1280 by 720. All right, so that's the size of this window that's going to open. So that's just good to start. Um, if you want to set a custom size or you want to fill the location, great. But let's just start there. Now we can do two things if we go to the bottom. We can open it as a separate window. And if we open it as a separate window, um, we get a floating window. And that's a preview of our, our perform um, out to a projector. But if we, uh, the, the thing with a separate window is that 
uh, in Windows and Mac OS operating systems, anytime you open a second window, there's a ton of extra overhead the GPU has to do to manage two windows. It's window management and it's slowing down your frame rate. So what we want to do in touch when we're finally doing an installation or putting it into performance mode is we want to actually do, use something called perform mode, which will close this editor in the background, it closes the editor, and it just gives you one window and it maximizes all your resources. So, for example, down here it says open as perform window. Now if I click that, my editor goes away and I just have this one thing. Now to get out of this mode, it's uh, just escape key like a full screen YouTube or Vimeo or something. And there is a shortcut to jump in between. If you press F1, you can jump into uh, perform mode anytime. All right. So we'll notice, you notice that this is a 1280 by 720, but I have a 1920 by 1080 screen. So there's a couple of ways we could deal with this. Um, I can make this 1920 by 1080. And now when I press F1, it's filling the screen pretty much. There's a border at the top and some weird stuff at the bottom, which we can fix in a second. Or the other way of doing it is if I had have left this at 1280 by 720, um, the other way of doing it in the window component is selecting fill location. And this is kind of handy if you don't know the resolution of whatever you're going to be outputting to. You're just giving it to somebody and they might be on a 4K projector or whatever. You don't know. Um, so in this case, it's just going to find it and, and scale it up. Now I want to highlight something here for you guys. If you're working with non-commercial and you're learning Touch Designer and you don't have that HD capability yet because you need a commercial license for unlimited resolution, you can still output to HD projectors using this. You can use fill location and it'll take, the only thing that is limited is in here, in your movie, in, up here, your movie is coming in at, it's downscaled to 1280 by 720. So your rendering pipeline is limited, but your output to projectors is not limited. You can do 4K, it's just going to scale up, okay? So don't get so worried about it until you really need all those pixels and then buy a license, please. <laughs> but um, so, so right now I'm taking a 1280 by 720 and scaling it up and it looks great and 90% of the people might not notice. So, you know, it's just food for thought. So let's actually make this a full screen proper application though because we have that border on top, which we don't like. So um, down here, there's a bunch of settings for all this stuff. So if I take borders and turn it off and try it again, okay, now I'm getting there. It actually is full screen. I have this little slider down in the corner, which is because I, I created a control panel earlier and I don't want the display there, so I, I could go in and turn off the display or delete it. Actually, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. If I take this slider, go to the panel page and turn display off. Okay, there we go. However, if you needed a control panel up there, that's how you do that. So. Now, I don't have a, a second projector here to really, uh, yeah, go ahead. Did you, uh, those controls would be really handy to have that on your own, uh, on your own monitor, on your main display. Yeah. Did you output the uh, GUI elements you created to your own uh, monitor? Yeah, you can. So, <laughs> There's a couple of ways of doing that, uh, uh, but uh, m most basically is, uh, you know what, let's, I'm gonna go in here, just give me a second, home, all right. Let's go get the one with these parameters here, and I'm gonna right click on it, save component. Okay. And I don't know why I'm not just copying and pasting it from inside, but I'm just, Happy that it's an external file today. Okay. So I have this here, and um, if you wanted these parameters here uh, as a panel, really quickly, you can go into these panels here, and there's a parameter panel component. So if I lay this down, and then I drag and drop this to here and turn off the built-in because I only want my custom parameters. Now look, I have this viewer here of the parameters, right? Yeah. And this could be inside here floating or something. 
Um, so actually, I can cut paste. I'll, I'll do that in a second. I'll do that in a second. Um, OK, so uh, back to this. If I'm, I'm outputting right now just to my single monitor. Now, if I had a second projector, I would change this to monitor 2. Unfortunately, I don't. So you just have to trust me that if you change that to uh, monitor 1, which is the second monitor over, and I pressed, it says that monitor doesn't exist, so what are you doing? But um, it will go out to the projector. All right. Now, <clears throat> I just said earlier, though, that if we wanted to have uh, maximum performance, we don't want two windows. So what happens if we have two projectors? How do we do two, right? So um, yeah, you're right. You basically, what you want to do is you want to make one big canvas that covers both of your projectors. All right. You don't want to open one window component and then a second one and have two separate windows. It's just gonna it's gonna hit your frame rate by ten frames a second, five frames a second, something like that. So to do that, um, let's merge these two into a setup that I'm gonna do in two projectors. One will go to projector one. One will go to projector two. Now earlier I put this into a base component and um, that's fine for if I was just building building blocks, but when I want to build control panels and I want to display it, I actually need a container. So that's okay. We don't have to redo everything, but we do have to right click on this guy and we have to say change component type. So we can go in here and change the component type and select container. And now it is a container. And I still have my custom parameters. That's good. It's complaining inside about something default viewer. So I have to change my node view to be the operator out one inside. Okay, now I'm, I'm back in the game now. So it's a container now, so it can be a floating window. It can be a control panel when it needs to be. All right. So um, now let's look at the size here. It is 400 by 300. So that's not the right size. And this one is 1280 by 720. Now, in this case, because they're going to be together, I can't just scale up across two projectors. I actually have to decide what the size is that I want. So uh, my projectors are all going to be HD projectors. So I'm going to make it 1920 by 1080 for both of them. Because we have to put this together in one big canvas to cover two projectors. So in this case, the fill location is not ideal. OK. I'm just going to make this a little smaller because it's, it's huge for some reason. Okay. So I have these two things here now. And what I want to do is I want to put it in one container that is two projectors big. So let's just make a new container. Uh, I'll make a new container component. And I'm lazy with math, so I'm going to do 1920 times 2. So it works it out for me. And then the height is 1080. So you can see that I have now something that is too wide and two projectors wide. So when you group uh, uh, panels together, you can put them inside or you can also just wire them from the bottom. These are components are the only operators that have these uh, top and bottom connectors. And this is basically for parenting. So by connecting these, I'm making these these things children of this parent. Uh, parent and children are just the nomenclature we use for a hierarchy. So a parent is above, parent two levels up is two levels above, etc. So now I have uh, this guy on the left and this guy is also just sitting there behind it. It's in the same position. So I have a few options. I can, I can select it and I have controls for, why is it not, I can't see this here. Ah, I, I know. All right. All right. It's better. It, I need to look at the panel and use a background. I have to set the background of this container. I, I kind of forgot a step there. So this container here is already set up to look at the background top, but this one is not looking at the background top. So inside, I had this thing called out one. So I can just say use out one and um, 
the nomenclature for that is dot slash, and that's called dot notation. So dot slash means go inside me and look for out one. If you use dot dot slash, it means go up to my parent and look for out one. Um, this is common programming uh, terms for relative paths. So, uh, so there you go. Now this is in the background. And now if, if I move this guy over on the layout page, you can see it. So I could move it over by exactly 1920 and okay, it, that's there. Um, there's another way of doing it though that I like better and, and that's by going to this guy, this container up here and checking out the children page. And this is basically alignment options for your children. So if you want to align your children um, from left to right or right to left, this is not political, this is just positional. <laughs> Uh, you can just say left to right and you get them automatically set up and you don't have to worry about changing the size later It's just automatically going to do it for you So if you change the size later to 4k You don't have to go in there and put that number to 4,000 pixels over to the right All right um, Interestingly enough, uh, do, you, do you remember the, uh, the movie bin that I showed you and all the movies were laid out? I didn't manually put those down. I actually just used this grid grid rows option here align them all in a grid and it automatically fit them into a grid so there's a lot of cool alignment features there um, now it's it's picking uh, which ones on the left and which ones on the right based on their name it's alphabetical so facet becomes it comes before project so it's kind of automatically putting them that way um, but you can override that using uh, the align order uh, parameter so align order will if I put this to make that two and make this one, uh, then it'll order them in that. And I, it's, it's probably a better idea to explicitly set that because then if you rename your thing later on, it might move things around on you unexpectedly. So, so now that I, uh, I have this double wide uh, window, um, which is too big for my screen, but um, <clears throat> what I can do is now go to my perform window and just set that. Now if I open it as, see it's going to say uh, you don't have a monitor over there so you can't really do that. And the other thing you need to be uh, aware of is the location is no longer a single monitor. You do have to say all monitors because you're going to address all the monitors. So uh, there's a few moving parts here but everything is really held in this window component. So with all monitors, can I do perform mode? Uh, nope. Well, I haven't had a crash in a workshop in at least eight months, so that is pretty good. <clears throat> Anyways. Um, so the moral of the story is try to have that projector set up before you press perform mode. And you're recording and you're doing 100 things, so yeah, that was a... Is there an auto save function? A control S. <laughs> so um, that's why those numbers increment so quickly. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I can I can get back there pretty quickly. But um, any questions right now uh, while I'm just rebuilding this thing? So how about mapping uh, the outputs? Mapping the outputs to. Oh, you mean projection mapping? Yeah. Um, so we have a number of tools for that, uh, that to get you started in the palette. Yeah. I'm going to open this up and go to tools. Yeah. Um, there is a Cantan mapper, which is a, it's for 2D based mapping. So you basically make masks uh, and you do it through the projector, put your projector at your thing, make masks, whatever. Um, you can do beziers, freeform shapes, squares, yeah. rectangles. It has texture editor there. It has keystoning in it. Um, in fact, actually, just for basic keystoning tools, there's something called Stoner uh, here. And Stoner, if I take this in and plug it in and open the Stoner window, this is a keystoner built into touch. All right, that's simple keystoning, but we also do grid warping. So you can do this kind of stuff with Bezier's, or you can make it linear. Um, you can, yeah, do all this. You can add another row in here. All right, so all this stuff is built into Stoner. 
the Canton mapper has that also sort of built into it as well, but the Canton mapper will allow you to build these masks and set textures. So, for example, if I open the Canton window and I'm going to uh, create a freeform here, a uh, rectangle, and then I'm also going to do a freeform down here, which is this. All right. Um, and then uh, I'm going to project a banana onto this guy. Whoops, sorry. I actually have to, um, where'd my banana go? There it is. Uh, I put it in the texture parameter here and turn it on. And maybe another movie here. Actually, I'll just, I'll be lazy and grab this guy. Grab a null and uh, select this one and put it on here. Okay. Yeah. So then you can uh, fine tune these points. If I select a point, I can you know nudge it with just the keys to get it cert perfectly aligned. Um, you can pr edit texture, and then you're in a texture editor here. So if you want to like um, scale this by two or uh, maybe 0.5 makes more sense, you know, whatever. You can do all this and uh, rotate things, okay? So that is 2D mapping. If you have a model of your, like a 3D model of your geometry that you're putting on, like you have a 3D architectural model of the building or you have a model of your box that you're projecting on, we have something called Cam CamSnapper. Um, excuse all the strange names. But uh, Cam Schnapper uses, um, if I open it here, this is the 3D cube I have. And uh, what I do is I select these points and then out the projector, you line up that point on that, on that thing in real life. Mm -hmm. And it will then do the math. Once you've set six, five or six points, it does the math to figure out exactly where your projector is and automatically maps uh, it perfectly onto that okay. device. Pardon? Yeah, and actually the math was done at YCAM uh, a long time ago by the Kimchi and Chips guys, and they uh, made that open source, and we used that math behind the scenes. And uh, it's six point minimum, but the more points you do, the more accurate it gets. And um, it's really cool, because once you have it mapped, uh, on you have your model in your scene, right? Like you can take a 3D component, uh, sorry, 3D light component, move it around the scene, and do like real 3D lighting in your space. So. Um, that's the tool you'd want to use for that. I don't really have time for doing projection mapping in an intro course because we could do a whole afternoon on projection mapping, but um, there is some talks going on about projection mapping uh, over the next two days. So. I was wondering, just uh, for image blending, yeah. projectors, okay. how do you do image blending? Yeah, so besides the fact you can always do it in tops yourself and make it, that's one thing about Touch that's really nice is that it's, it's an open platform, open programming visual platform, right? So if you have a problem that the tool can't fix, you can usually solve the problem yourself. You just sort of deconstruct it and fix it. But we do have some components for standard projection mapping. Like if you're doing a projector blend here, this is a projector array two, uh, one. Let's say I have three projectors wide. And then I'm going to, uh, I don't know, I'll just pipe in this. Um, it will give you then your three projectors, and you have overlap regions here. And uh, you can adjust the hue saturation value, luma gamma is for every projector to get them lined up. Um, but this, this is just for uh, grid format. It's not going to do uh, dome blending, for example. All right? So in dome blending, um, we don't have a built-in uh, thing to do that. There are some stuff in our forum, though. And uh, also, uh, what else? There's, so, there's definitely some examples on our forum. There's a couple of uh, people that have put out applications that do it. So and check that out. So uh, just before we break, because we're running out of time, I do want to say uh, one thing about where to get more help and, and how to keep on going with Touch. So remember, Every single operator has the help right here. This question mark will take you to the help for that operator. And if you're into Python, this Python question mark takes you to the Python help for that. But besides that, uh, in general, there's a, a quick link to the wiki here, up here. If you just click this, it goes to the wiki, which is the full documentation for Touch Designer. 
Um, and the forum here is where we do all of our support. So if you have a problem with Touch Designer and you're trying to figure out something, please ask a question here. If you have a problem with your account or licensing or something else that is a personal issue, um, I'm personal with respect to your account, <laughs> um, just email us directly. But when it's a Touch Designer question, please ask in the forum because uh, the community can help answer and also other people can benefit from the answer. All right? Um, if you uh, um, want to check out some tutorials, there's a hot link for that too up here, which goes to our tutorials page. Um, some of the workshop videos from previous workshops have been recorded here. So if you want to go through, for example, the movie bin uh, creation that I was showing earlier, there is uh, something down here about creating movie bins and instancing, which I'm sorry I didn't get to today, um, but there's a nice tutorial here that does instancing uh, in a San Francisco workshop we did a couple years ago. Um, there's also in this help menu, one gold mine is called the operator snippets. And operator snippets is sort of like, if anyone's familiar with Max, you have those inline patch notes that you can kind of pop up examples. So this isn't exactly that inline, but it pops up a new tow file that has uh, examples of many of the nodes in context. So it's going to open a new, up, uh, a new tow file, which takes a second here. Um, but once it gets going... You'll see the familiar op create dialog. And then the ones that are white have some help associated with them. So if I go to the movie file in, I can see the movie file in and how it works and some, some tricks. There's a couple different examples, how to use it on a timeline, how to use it for an image. If I go to chop, for example, maybe uh, the timer chop is a good example because there's tons of examples here. Um, how to use text per segment, for example. Um, or cycle and alert. How to use the timer chop to cycle something and give you an alert every time the cycle is over. Um, these sort of things. So if you're curious about how to use an operator and want to see it in context, here's EtherDream. EtherDream has an example for using lasers. And it even comes with a laser preview that's being rendered in SOPS. All right. So you can get started quickly by checking out op snippets. One thing I will caution though, because you're opening another file, if you're on a laptop, you're gonna be running two touch designers at the same time. So when you're not using this, you can minimize it so it doesn't cook and take up your resources. Or you can uh, use this power button up top. And this power button will turn off all the cooking and calculating so your computer doesn't overheat when you're running five instances of touch designer. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was just how to keep in contact with us and um, and uh, basically if you want to see what people are building with Touch Designer, so uh, first and foremost is obviously our website. Um, we will highlight some things on the homepage, uh, but if you go to the bottom of the homepage here, there's a news archive. And this has all the stories that we've done over the years of what our customers have been building with uh, Touch Designer. And uh, it's amazing work. Um, if you go to the blog, there are longer format articles, which usually include you know, um, uh, interviews with the artists and designers. And they talk about how they use Touch and what features of Touch to help them. Uh, might give you some idea of how they're accomplishing certain things. This thing is crazy. This is Alien Covenant. It's like... 96 screens on set, like insane stuff that we have no idea that they're building it until they tell us, hey, look what we built. Mm -hmm. I mean, insane stuff. Um, so it might give you some inspiration and just uh, give you an idea of what is possible uh, with Touch Designer. Um, and to that note, uh, for more help, uh, the Facebook gr help group is an amazing resource. Um, so it's just uh, facebook.com groups uh, Touch Designer help. It was started here in Europe by Richard Burns from UK. So uh, a lot of the people on here are on your time zone. So it's really good for you guys. Um, post a question, uh, jump in, and people will help you through things. Um, there's also a Slack channel. I'm going to leave this up if anyone wants to take a picture of this or copy these down. Um, and the Slack, this is just to join. Um, the Slack channel for Touch Designer is, is pretty active and you can, uh, you can ask questions directly of people that you might not have access to otherwise. Uh, a lot of the people giving talks here are here helping people all the time. 
So um, it's a pretty cool way of, of getting uh, some really fast help when you're in a jam. Um, and then just for us, I mean, uh, if you want to know what people are building with Touch Designer, uh, we also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash touch designer. You can see uh, what people are building and, and if we have events coming up, please, not now. Um, and uh, things that are going on, laser show reel from, this is Scalar, the thing that I was talking about the other day. It's pretty beautiful. Um, we're also on Twitter at one null one. Um, if you prefer Twitter and you just want to see when their events are coming up, see what people are building. And uh, for those of you on Instagram, also Instagram slash touch designer. Um, uh, just a bunch of pretty pictures and sometimes some interesting um, behind the scenes looks. If I were you guys and wanted to go deeper and wanted some new tutorials, I would check out Matt Regan's website, uh, MatthewRegan.com. He is um, an amazing teacher and he has this website that is an epic resource of, of touch designer things. Uh, if you want to get started with Python, he has an entire section of the site devoted to starting with Python from ground one, from print hello world to writing extensions and in the touch designer context. So it's not, it's relatable. Um, so I'd really uh, recommend his site. Um, and of course, you can always contact us directly if you want help with something and we can point you into the right direction. So it's amazing how quickly four hours can go. We didn't even have that break that I was talking about. Um, but uh, thank you for sticking in there. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you know, hit me over the weekend and uh, over lunch and I'd be happy to, uh, to help you. And I'd also be very interested to see what you guys do uh, normally and what you're interested in using Touch Designer for because that helps us and uh, helps me understand what you guys want to do. So, so introduce yourself and, uh, and dive in. So, thank you.